Tick tock, time to rock. How is everyone doing during this lovely, lovely quarantine season? <laughs> well, the, 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 the positive side about a quarantine, if, if you want to make the best of it, if you want to make the best of the situation, you, you got some time to do some studying, got some time to do some reading, got some time to watch videos and live stream and so on. So, yep, might as well make the best of a bad situation. And here we are. And one of the things we like to do is discuss issues that are of massive importance to the entire world. And one of the biggest questions of all time is, was Muhammad a true prophet? I am joined here tonight or today or where, where, whatever time it is, wherever you're from, ladies and gentlemen. But I'm here with Dr. Tony Costa. Tony Costa, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Why don't you give everyone an update on how things are in Canada? Yeah, well, I'm in Toronto, and we're still uh, we're still on lockdown. Our schools, our universities, uh, restaurants uh, are shut down. We just recently shut down our parks and recreation, so kids are not permitted to go to the parks because of the danger of um, touching poles that may have been infected by other children with the COVID virus. And so, yeah, it looks like it goes down here in Toronto. It definitely looks like uh, apocalyptic days, to be mm -hmm. sure. Um, any idea on... Uh like, 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 is that just a precaution or, or are there like outbreak? Cause I, I haven't followed the news at all about, about Canada. I just, I tend to ignore Canada completely. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. How, how, how bad is it up there? Like say with compared with, you know, the U S well, not as bad. I mean, our, the U S is population obviously is 10 times ours. And, uh, but the numbers keep increasing. The highest uh, numbers are in Quebec, the province of Quebec. Um, and then we have Ontario where I'm from and then British Columbia. Uh, the ones that seem to be the least affected seem to be the Northwest Territories, the uh, the Yukon and Northwest Territories. Uh, Manitoba is not so bad. Saskatchewan, not so bad. But uh, it's getting to the point where the authorities uh, are talking about issuing fines uh, if, if people don't abide by the, the mm -hmm. quarantine. And so, as you know, David, I'm sure the same with Virginia. Our churches have been closed. And so uh, all our services have gone online as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, uh, yep, ladies and gentlemen, got to make the best of the situation, and so, here we are. And I noticed, I noticed, uh, before we actually went live, I noticed some Muslims in the chat um, were there arguing for Muhammad. Uh, guys, Muslims, if you're there, no need to be quiet. Uh, once we actually start, we will give you the opportunity to defend your prophet. So, um Let's go ahead. Oh, by the way, uh, I put up on the screen there. Sophia Film said, Tony looking fresh. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we are. Wait, what is this? Truth and courage. David Wood, don't say. Don't say what you don't. Hang on. Let me see here. Truth and courage said, David Wood, don't say what you don't about Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. We do not call bad word any messenger we do not make any distinguish between them all um yes you do truth and courage uh yes you do uh one the the one thing the, the most important thing that you do is that you view every other messenger through the lens of one messenger you say whatever this messenger says about every other messenger is true and even if we have records of them completely contradicting our one messenger we're going to just believe what our messenger says about every other messenger and we, we don't care and so you actually truth and courage what you actually believe in is one messenger you believe in one guy and whatever he says about everyone else. So that means you actually have one witness, one guy who supports you. Um, what, what do you think? What do you think about that, Tony? You're exactly right, David. And, and in the in the Quran, in Surah Seven, you have the covenant that uh, Allah makes with the prophets, the, the Mathik. He makes this covenant with the prophets that there is a messenger who is coming, and do you agree that you will support him? Do you agree that you will be a witness to him? And so even Allah constrains the prophets uh, to uh, enter this covenant whereby they agree that they will support this messenger who is to come, uh, who is believed to be Muhammad. So all the prophets are all pointers. They're pointing to Muhammad. So that doesn't sound like they're all the same. Mm -hmm. Not at all. And also and also the fact that Jesus's ministry, according to Islam, was, was restricted only to the children of Israel and Muhammad's was a global uh, ministry. Uh, that does not smack of fairness at all. That's that's clearly per a preferential treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, 
I mean, my goodness, people start passing around cartoons about, you know, of Moses or Jesus. Muslims don't 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 care that much. Uh, start no. passing around cartoons of Muhammad. People have to die. That's right. not uh, that's not. Uh, yeah. So truth and courage. You got to try that with someone else, my friend. Uh, if you have any other. Wait, <laughs> hang on. He posted. <laughs> Truth and Courage said uh, they are all good and righteous. Well, that is going to bring us uh, to some of the stuff we say about your prophet Muhammad. Uh, first of all, that's false. Even about the even about biblical prophets, right? If if they're all if they're all righteous, right? I mean, if you look at what what King David did, that's that's some bad stuff. Moses did some bad stuff. Um, Muhammad. Now, Muhammad takes the cake, right? Muhammad takes the cake of, of all of them. But but the difference is. The difference is you look at it at, at biblical prophets, they may have uh, committed sins, sometimes very, 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 very bad sins. Sometimes they do that. Um, but in the Bible, it's a sin, right? In the, the They will be condemned for their sins in the Bible. The difference between them and Muhammad, and here's another difference is whenever Muhammad does it, I'll, it it's just right, right? So if Muhammad has sex with a nine-year-old girl and uh, uh, tells his followers they can have up to four wives when he has nine or 11, um, or takes the wife of his own adopted son, or tortures a man for money, when Muhammad does all of these things, it's good and right. And so that is a massive difference between everyone before Muhammad and Muhammad. As far as everyone before Muhammad, Jesus was the only real righteous one. Um, and that's true according to, even according to your religion. Remember, Satan touches everyone who's born in the world, but couldn't touch Jesus. That's according to your prophet. And your prophet had to repeatedly, over and over again, like a beating drum, ask for forgiveness. Uh, according to those closest to him, he would have to, he had to ask for forgiveness from Allah 70 times a day. 70 times a day. Tony, what was this guy doing? I've never heard yeah. of, I've never heard of anyone who had to ask forgiveness that much every day. Exactly. And take and 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 also take a, a tally of it as well. Mm -hmm. But you're right, David. I mean, in the Quran, what does it say? The only prophet who is said to be righteous and to be perfect and sinless was Jesus. Uh, not Muhammad, not Noah, not Moses, not David, not Solomon. Only Jesus was said to be holy and without sin. And so when he says they were all righteous, that's manifestly uh, false. Uh, you also know, David, that in some hadith, Muhammad says that Satan touches every child when it is born, and that's why they cry when they're born, because Satan touches them, he pricks them. Um, and some hadith actually say, except Jesus and his mother. And so now, now Islam not only throws Jesus into the batch, now you've got Jesus and his mother who have not been touched by uh, sin. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of Roman Catholics will give a thumbs up to that, mm -hmm. because of course they believe in the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, you're saying th they're all good and righteous. Again, that, that's just not true according to your own religion. And if you're saying they're all equal, I mean, there's a long list of ways they're they're not equal. I mean, Jesus, born of a virgin. Jesus performs all kinds of miracles. Uh, Jesus is the Messiah, according to Islam. Uh, Muhammad, not so much. Uh, Jesus, uh, Allah wouldn't even allow people to kill Jesus, according to your religion. He he took him to heaven and rescued him. Uh, if you compare this with Muhammad, Muhammad, definitely not born of a virgin, um, couldn't perform any miracle except for the Quran. He's not the Messiah. And Allah allowed Muhammad to be poisoned to death by a Jewish woman who was upset because her entire family had been slaughtered by Muslims. So, I'm not seeing a lot of similarities. I'm not seeing a lot of uh, equality here among the prophets. So we'll keep going, and uh, maybe you've got, maybe you'll have some something better for us as the uh, as the as the live stream continues. Uh, here's a comment by an apparently insane person, Catherine Hancock said, "Well, what am I supposed to do? You won't answer my calls. You change your number. I mean, I'm not gonna be ignored, David. Uh, Catherine, no idea who you are. You certainly aren't calling my phone." <laughs> And if you say, I've changed my number, I've had the same phone number for the past 20 years. So, I don't know who you think you're calling, but you ain't calling me Catherine. So, um, quit acting like a lunatic or I'll have to block you. No idea who you are. All right, Tony. Tony, uh, why is why is this, an, uh, and I'm, I'm bringing this up because uh, you're, you're, an, you're an educated man and um, you're educated in theology and uh, you, yet you've dedicated a good portion of your life to dealing with the claims of Islam. So why do you why do you think this is an, an important issue? 
No, I think it's an important issue because it has to do with the eternal destiny of people's souls. And my concern is that if Muhammad is not a prophet of God, and I think the evidence is overwhelming that he's not, uh, I think that the fact that uh, a great portion of our society, uh, maybe a quarter of our world's population, uh, follows this man as the messenger of God and as the prophet of God, as God's mouthpiece. And so the fact that this is uh, that this has to do with the ultimate destiny of souls and that to to believe in a prophet who's not a prophet of God and to follow someone who basically rewrites uh, the, the the scriptures, rewrites the, the theme of the Bible, rewrites the storyline, gives us another Jesus, gives us um, a view of Jesus that none of the early Christians understood or preached or taught. The Bible warns us that whoever has the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not have the Son will not see life, but God's wrath continues on that person. So my concern is that Muslims are going into a Christless eternity because they put their faith in a man who is not a prophet. And so this this has eternal significance, and this has ramifications that, uh, you know, we're talking about the coronavirus, David, but there's something much more lethal than the coronavirus, and that's sin, our rebellion against God. And that will, that will uh, ostracize us from the uh, presence of God for all eternity. And so that is why I'm so concerned about this topic, because Muslims do put their faith in Muhammad. They say they don't, but they put Muhammad on the same level with Allah, and they do uh, put him in a place of divinity, mm -hmm. uh, even to the point of praying to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, very creepy stuff going on there in Islam. So, yes, ladies and gentlemen, you got 1.6 billion people following this man. And not only that, you've got uh, politicians and journalists and educators praising him as some great person to uh, to follow. Uh, one of the one of the next videos I'm going to make is it was a Newsweek Newsweek magazine had an article saying that in this time of coronavirus, we need to seek guidance from Muhammad on staying clean and things like that. And I was just thinking, yeah. and they'll, they'll, they'll quote him, <laughs> it's so dumb. They'll quote him saying, yes, Muhammad encouraged ablutions, these washings, and if we just do that, wow, that'll help us all stay clear of coronavirus. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this passage, Tony, but there's a passage in Sunan Abu Dawud where his followers say, uh, hey, there, Muhammad, there's this well over here, but people have been throwing used menstrual cloths, dumping their toilet buckets, their feces and urine in here, and uh, throwing dead animals, dead animal carcasses into it. Uh, is it okay if we use that to perform our ablutions? And Muhammad says, yes, of course, water is not made impure by anything. And so I just want to say, if you're saying, hey, we need to follow Muhammad's advice to avoid spreading diseases, he said, perform these washings. Uh, don't just quote that. Quote what he what he actually said. Hey, you can use any water, even if it has, even if people throw their feces, urine, used menstrual cloths, and dead animals into that water, it's still perfectly good to rub all over yourself. And then you can rub it all over yourself. Then you can go climb on top of your wife. And of course, Muhammad would have sex with nine wives in one night with, while only taking one bath afterwards. So he's getting all this stuff, all this, all this feces and urine all over him. I mean, all over himself first, and then all over his wives and so on. And and so he's the example of, of perfect cleanliness, according to Newsweek. But uh, yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to have some fun with that one, uh, Tony. <laughs> yeah, also, you know, when you look at the Bible in the Old Testament, if you really want to see what hyg hygiene looks like, God had revealed it to Moses. In the book of Leviticus, he talks about quarantining uh, people with leprosy, or if a house has mold in it, uh, there's there's talk about if you have to relieve yourself, you have to do it outside the camp. And so really this idea of purity is something that we find in the Bible. Uh, but you're absolutely right, Dave. And let's not forget as well that he also permitted people to drink camel urine mm -hmm. um, and thought that it was an aid to certain diseases and so forth. And uh, to, to dunk your flies, right? If a, if a fly lands in yeah. your food, don't don't pull it out and throw it away or throw the food out. Uh, dunk it to make, because uh, one of the wings has a, has a disease, but the other wing has the cure for the disease. And so according right. to Muhammad, any disease that's carried by a fly also has the cure for the disease on that fly. I don't know why Muslim doctors don't just go prove him right by saying, okay, here are all the diseases that, that are carried by flies, and now we've got cures for all those diseases because they're all right there on the, uh, on the, on the opposite wing, just as Muhammad said. All right. And by, by the way, uh, <laughs> Nabil told me he did that once when he was a kid because his grandma told him to. <laughs> he said his grandma told him to dunk the fly because it's got the cure, and he said, so I kept dunking it because I wanted all the cure. I wanted all that cure. <laughs> 
Um, all right, so uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and wait, let me get a couple comments here. Um, Pitar, hey, P hey, hey, Peter Pitar, uh, I, I asked you before, but I, I didn't see your response. Tell me right now, please. Uh, your name is spelled different. I know different. I know that is um, uh, that is a different version of Peter. But tell me right now if it's pronounced different. I was, I was pronouncing it differently because I, I'm assuming that because it's spelled differently, it's pronounced differently. But Pitar. Or is it just pronounced like like Peter? Go ahead and tell me real quick, and that way I can fix that because you comment a lot, and uh, just want to be right here. Um, but the comment here is: I heard somewhere that Muhammad passed some test of prophethood. I don't know what they're talking about. Muhammad can't possibly be a prophet. He failed. Uh, yeah, as far there are all kinds of things that they'll they'll Muslims will set up and they'll say, ah, you know. Here's how we can know that there's a prophet. Or Muhammad said this, and here's a way we can test him and so on. It can even be silly things like um, the previous scriptures revealed that if you have a big giant mole uh, in a certain place, then that's that's the seal of prophethood. And so that that tells us that you're a prophet. Um, and so it's all kinds of weird things. So you, yeah, yeah, you'd have to ask the particular Muslim. Uh, Tony, what are you aware of any uh, test of prophethood that Muhammad no. passed? No, other than the prophecy uh, about the Persians and the Romans going to war in a couple of years, uh, within 10 years, that's not a prophecy. That was something that anyone could have guessed. Um, uh, even the signs. I mean, when the people said uh, to him, look, if you're a prophet, then show us a sign. And mm -hmm. in the Quran, he cannot produce any signs. Mm -hmm. He's only a warner. The, the Quran repeatedly says he's just a warner. He's just a warner. And so when he was asked to back up his claims, like Moses and Jesus and other prophets, he couldn't perform any of them. However, you get to the Hadith, which comes over 230 years later or so, and all of a sudden you've got water coming out of his fingers. Uh, you have uh, the vegetables crying out Allahu Akbar in the marketplace. You know, something like an Islamic version of Veggie Tales and, and all these things, uh, all of these things start happening. But that's, again, because Christians were challenging Muslims. And so the Hadith, uh, without surprise, the Hadith starts producing all these so-called miracle stories. But if we go by the Quran, the Quran clearly says Muhammad performed no miracles. And so Muslims have had to resort to what? Well, yes, the, the, the Quran is a miracle. And uh, the number 19, Shabir Ali still is pumping this out. The number 19 uh, is a number that runs throughout the Quran, and therefore we know the Quran's a miracle because nobody could have written a book like the Quran. Um, we have Amelia here. Uh, we have Amelia here in the Super Chat. She says, uh, is having sex with a child righteous like Muhammad? And um, yeah, for our, our, our Muslim friends who are going to give us uh, evidence about Muhammad, um, there's all kinds of arguments you could use. If you want to just say, you know, Muhammad was good and righteous, better be prepared for us to respond. So Amelia is asking a question here based on, based, notice, she based this on the, the claim of a Muslim. Muslim said he's good and righteous. Muhammad is good and righteous. So is it good and righteous to have sex with a prepubescent nine-year-old girl? And not only for Muhammad to do that, but because he is the pattern of conduct for all Muslims, is it is it good and righteous for him to set that example for all future Muslims? Is that uh, is that uh, a good thing. Oh, and, and Amelia did a follow-up. She said, apparently in Islam, having sex with a child is supposedly righteous. Welcome to Islam, where everything is uh, upside down. Yeah, so guys, uh, you know, for, for those of you who want to say, oh, it was a different culture or something like that, uh, yeah, yeah, we can look to previous uh, cultures and say, well, maybe they didn't know better or something like that. But when your, when your prophet, when your prophet is set up by your God as the example for other people to follow should be holding him to a pretty high standard. And uh, if, if, if we're looking at it to him as a standard, then you have to answer stuff like this and you have to say as a Muslim, nope, it's, it's good and righteous to have sex with a prepubescent nine-year-old girl. And I uh, hope you're ready to defend that. Um, now, this is a little bit different. This is a little bit different from the the order we were going to go in. So j just so everyone knows, when um, when we're talking about this, uh, when we're talking about whether Muhammad was a prophet, I usually set it up and I say, okay, if if if, if someone is claiming to speak for God, there are, there are three basic three basic possibilities. Uh, one, he might be getting revelations from his own head and his surroundings, and if that's the case, he could either be lying, he's doing it deliberately, or he could actually be deluded or insane or something like that, right? So, um, if it, it, 
the, history is filled with people who believe they're speaking for from God. They really think they're speaking from God, and yet they're they're deluded, right? They're 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 they've got mental health problems and so on. So, uh, or there there are, there are people who claim to be prophets and they're not deluded; they're lying, right? They're 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 using that to try and deceive people in order to get something out of them. So the question is, uh, do we have good reasons to think that Muhammad is getting revelations from his own mind? That's one possibility. Another possibility is that uh, there's a de there's an actual demonic source. So this wouldn't be available to atheists or. or but uh, for, you know, Christians, Muslims, Jews, people who believe in a supernatural realm, we have to consider the possibility that there are dark, evil forces at work. And a person might actually be getting revelations that he says he's getting, but they're just not coming. They're not coming from God or from, a, from a, an angel that's actually uh, following God. So that's another possibility. And then the third possibility would be that the revelations actually come from God. And so there we would want to know, okay, what reason do we have to think that this person is actually getting revelations from God? In the case of Muhammad, that would be what arguments do you have that actually support this? Um, so that's kind of the issue, but Crusader Bear uh, brings this one uh, up. Uh, what do you think about the theory that says Muhammad was possessed? What do you think about it, Tony? Well, I think it's, uh, I think there's a very good chance that he was. Um, well, if we look at his first call, uh, Surah 96 records for us the call of Muhammad, the cave, it's called, the Surah of the Cave. And according to the Hadith, uh, he goes to Mount Hira, and while he's there in the, in the cave meditating, he tells us that uh, a spirit appears to him, uh, seizes him by the throat, and then says to him, Ekara, recite in the name of your Lord. And Muhammad says, what am I supposed to recite? And then he, he squeezes his grip on his neck, and then he says, recite in the name of your Lord. And Muhammad says, what am I supposed to recite? And then he did it the third time. The third time Muhammad actually thought he was going to pass out from this. Uh, this recorded again in, in, in uh, Ibn Ashaq as well, in his Sirah, uh, and also in the Hadith. So what ends up happening after this, David, is that he walks away from this experience. Now, mind you, he's by himself. There are no witnesses with him. Uh, all right? So he's by himself. And he walks away from this experience. And the first thing he thinks of is not, God has called me to be a prophet. The first thing he thinks of is, oh, my heavens, I think I've been possessed by the jinn. I've been possessed. And the first thing he does is he, he becomes suicidal. He wants to cast himself over the cliffs. Now, we have to step back, David, and we have to ask this question. If this man is a prophet in line with the other prophets in the Bible, which the Quran says he is, he comes in the line of prophets from, from Abraham to, to, to Jesus to David, Solomon, etc., John the Baptist, but if you look at the way biblical prophets were called, um, Exodus 3 with Moses, the burning bush, Joshua, Joshua 5, when he meets the Lord, captain of the Lord's army, uh, Isaiah uh, 6, when the prophet sees the Lord high and lifted up, Ezekiel 1, uh, Jeremiah is calling in Jeremiah 1. When all of these prophets were called, none of them said, you know what, I wonder if that was Beelzebub talking to me there. I wonder if that was the devil. None of them said this. And, and the other thing is none of the prophets became suicidal. You don't see Moses running off Mount Sinai wanting to throw himself off the cliffs. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing he does is he runs to his wife, Khadija, and he says, cover me. I, I think I've been possessed by the jinn and so forth and so on. And so and that doesn't stop there, David. Uh, he, he gets suicidal when the spirit who later is identified as Jibril, uh, Gabriel, he becomes suicidal when Jibril doesn't show up. And so this type of behavior smacks of someone who who is not coming to contact with the biblical God, the God Yahweh. And listen to this. Khadija is the one who confirms him. She's the one who basically says, no, 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 this comes from uh, Allah. This, and then her cousin says, this is the same revelation that M Musa, Moses received and so forth. So when you really think about it, David, it was actually the testimony of a woman that confirmed Muhammad's prophethood. And yet the Quran says that the testimony of a woman is half that of a man. So I just find it quite ironic that were it not for his first wife, Khadija, Muhammad may not have got started. He would have probably ended up mm -hmm. committing suicide. That does not sound like the calling of a biblical prophet. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, could also point out that, I mean, just imagine, uh, just imagine you ladies, your, your husband comes home, he's suicidal, he thinks he's possessed, he's trying to kill himself, he's talking about uh, whatever it is, this this thing in the cave that uh, that pressed upon him until he thought he was he was about to die, and he's he's suicidal. I think a lot of women are going to say whatever it will, whatever they need to say in order to calm their husband down, so he doesn't hurl himself off a cliff. 
And who in the world is Khadija to be an authority on who is and who is not receiving revelations from Allah? Muhammad thought he was demon-possessed. Khadija, who wasn't there, who had no idea what he saw, she just knows that her husband's uh, losing his mind and, and trying to kill himself. Um, she says, no, 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 you're a, you're a prophet, honey. Don't, don't kill yourself, you're a prophet. And then, of course, Muhammad receives all this revelation saying women don't know what they're talking about and they're stupid and they have half the intellectual ability of a man and so on. So interesting stuff there. Um, now, uh, <laughs> we do have a uh, we do have some defenses of Muhammad here. Uh, this isn't on. The, I haven't scrolled down to the, the, the what we were just talking about, but mentioning Aisha, uh, Ahmed here says uh, Aisha entered to puberty when she married because I said the word prepubescent. I said prepubescent. So. Ahmed here said, uh, Aisha entered to puberty when she married Prophet Muhammad. She was clever and wise. It is not same as today, nine-year-old girl. So it's not the same as a nine-year-old girl today. Well, uh, Ahmed, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and bring up a few passages just because I already had them here from a previous show. But we'll go ahead and take a little peek at a few passages real quick. And you'll tell me if this sounds like a, you know, a, a mature woman. But let's go ahead and read a few of these real quick. We'll do this lightning round. Uh, the chapter heading in Sahih al-Bukhari, <laughs> the chapter heading here in Sahih al-Bukhari is giving one's young children in marriage is permissible. So Aisha is being described as a young child. Giving one's young children in marriage is permissible. And then to introduce this section, Bukhari quotes the Quran to show that giving one's young children in marriage is permissible. Uh, by virtue of the statement, and for those who have no monthly courses, i.e. they are still immature, ver Quran verse 65, uh, chapter 65, verse 4, and the idda for the girl before puberty is three months in the above verse, right? The idda is the waiting period if you're going to divorce uh, one of your wives. Notice, this is talking about the waiting period for divorcing a wife after having sex with her, and it says, before puberty. Why? Because the Quran verse, chapter 65, verse 4, says those who have no monthly courses, they don't have a monthly period. Why? Because they're prepubescent. Because they're prepubescent, right? So this is how Bukhari sets it up. And why am I pointing this out? I, 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 we weren't going to go into all this, but Ahmed here says, nope, she'd reached she'd reach puberty. Well, Bukhari says she didn't. So who do I believe? You or the greatest, most respected Hadith collector of all time? But here's what he says. Uh, here's the Hadith. So narrated Aisha, Sahih al-Bukhari, 5133, narrated Aisha that the Prophet wrote the marriage contract with her when she was six years old, and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old, and then she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. Um, all right, we're going to do these rapid fire real quick. Um, Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, 5134, narrated Aisha that the Prophet wrote the marriage contract with her when she was six years old, and he consummated his marriage with her when she was nine years old. Hisham said, I have been informed that Aisha remained with the Prophet for nine years, i.e. till his death. Um, we have 5158, Sahih al-Bukhari. Narrated Urwa, the Prophet wrote the marriage contract with Aisha while she was six years old and consummated his marriage with her while she was nine years old, and she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. We have Bukhari 6130, and pay close attention, Ahmed. Narrated Aisha, I used to play with the dolls in the presence of the Prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's messenger used to enter my dwelling place, they would hide themselves, but the Prophet would call them to join and play with me. Up, oh, objection pops up. Why is Aisha playing with dolls when that's forbidden in Islam? Well, as it turns out, it was only forbidden once you had reached puberty. And we have it right here. The playing with the dolls and similar images is forbidden, but it was allowed for Aisha at that time as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. So, Ahmed, looks like looks like you don't like the idea of your prophet having sex with a nine-year-old girl. And so you've bought into the myths and lies of Muslim apologists who tell you, nope, she had reached puberty. She had definitely reached puberty. When according to the Quran, there's nothing wrong with having sex with a prepubescent girl. You can marry a prepubescent girl, have sex with her, and then divorce her all before she's reached the age of puberty. Allah thinks it's perfectly fine. And then that hadith is used to describe Muhammad's relationship with 
Aisha, Aisha was still playing with dolls when she was married to Muhammad and was having sex with him. She was allowed to continue playing with dolls. Why? We, we have it right there. She was allowed to play with dolls because she hadn't reached puberty. And so, once again, Muslims believe one thing while their sources say something completely different. Any thoughts on this one, Tony? <clears throat> well, I, I totally agree with you. And that's exactly what Bukhari says and what the sources say. Uh, I think it's repugnant that that still goes on today in, the, in Islamic countries. That still continues. And one of the first things that uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran did when the Ayatollah took over was they they lowered the marriage age of, of girls right down to the age of nine. And so it is absolutely repugnant. Those of us who are parents and those of us who have children, particularly daughters, would you give your nine year old or your six year old daughter into a marriage contract with a with a, a man in his 50s and then allow your daughter who's nine years old to marry a man who's 54? Um, so this is absolutely repugnant. This is something that Jesus would never have done. In fact, Jesus never endorsed that. He, he called the children to come to him and he blessed them. Uh, but this is what I'm talking about, David, is that once you make this man the pattern of conduct, the Quran says that Allah says that 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 he is the pattern of conduct for those who fear Allah and who fear the last day and so forth. And then Allah says to Muhammad that you are, are on an exalted standard of character, an exalted standard of character, a 54 year old man who has sex with a nine-year-old girl. How do you have sex with a nine-year-old girl? Mm -hmm. This is absolutely repugnant and absolutely disgusting and unbecoming of a man who uh, would claim to be a prophet of God who's holy and just. Hey, Tony, uh, I'm sure you've seen this before, but one thing I I've noticed uh, over the years, and I've seen this literally thousands of times, is when you start bringing up uh, facts that Muslims, you know, they, they, they just don't want people to know and they'll try to claim that we're making things up and so on. They'll do things like that. But when you bring up that uh, Muhammad, uh, his initial interpretation of his revelations was that they were demonic. Um, when you bring up that he tried repeatedly to kill himself, this has got not, and, 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 not just then. Muhammad did it multiple times, right? So after he supposedly began receiving revelations and he thought he was demon-possessed, he tried to kill himself. Uh, later, once he believed he was a prophet and the revelations stopped, what did he do? He ran up on a cliff and tried, mm -hmm. to, tried to kill himself. So the, the great pattern of conduct for, for Muslims around the world is a guy who, anytime something went wrong, he would immediately run and rush off to kill himself. Um, so you can point those things out. Uh, you can... You can of course, things that we, we didn't really mention yet, but they fall into the same category. The satanic verses when Muhammad yeah. received revelations promoting polytheism, telling Muslims that they could pray to pagan goddesses and that those pagan goddesses would carry their prayers mm -hmm. to Allah. So he's claiming that this is consistent with Tawheed. You had Muhammad was walking around uh, delusional with, with uh, weird thoughts and false beliefs and he finally snapped out of it and he said it's because a, a magician cast a spell on him. And so, right. so he was noticed. This is God's last and greatest messenger. And yet he was wide open. He was wide open to ma magicians, right? Magi That's right. If you were a magician and you got a hair from Muhammad's hairbrush, you could take this guy out for some time. They're not sure exactly how long he was having these delusional thoughts and false beliefs, but uh, the estimates are between six months and two years. So you could you get a hair off this guy's hairbrush, take it to a magician. The magician casts a spell and Muhammad's out of commission for a long time. Uh, so you have all, all of these kinds of uh, spiritual issues, and we bring these up, and then we talk about, uh, you know, Muhammad and Aisha and Muhammad having sex with a prepubescent girl, and watch watch how Muslims respond. This is what I was talking about, right? I've seen this thousands of times. You start pointing all this out, and they have nothing to say, so they just go, you're just increasing my faith, and you don't even know it. Oh, you're just strengthening my faith. They say this, and then, like, you run into them a year later, and they're not Muslims anymore, and they're saying, yeah, yeah, I was just I was just making that up. Nabil is like this. The, the, the more Nabil and I talked about the character of Muhammad, the more devout he seemed to become as a Muslim. Until, you know, just in emails, he was signing off as humble servant of the truth and things like that. And then he left Islam, right? He couldn't take it. It's, 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 a, it's a kind of posturing. It's a kind of posturing to pretend that you're not conflicted by the information. Right. But I'm pointing all this out because check out Truth, truth and Courage. He's been posting this stuff over and over again. This only, right. this only increased my faith in Allah. Keep going on, David Wood. Oh my goodness, truth and courage. You want us to keep going to keep blasting your prophet? We will. Your wish is our command. You want us to keep blasting away at Muhammad's character, at Muhammad's uh, uh, whatever it is, if he's demonic or he's just crazy? No problem. We are, we're here to help. 
So we are going to help. Yeah, the, the truth. The truth will set him free, right, David? Yeah. Eventually, the truth will set him free. But but you know, you have to understand why Muslims do have this mindset. Mm -hmm. Think about it, David. If from childhood, the first words you were taught was the Shahada. And you would say over and over again, Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad Rasulullah, mm -hmm. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, the Muhammad. And you say that not only five times a day, but you pray the, the, the Surah Al-Fatiha, the first uh, Surah, 17 times a day. And you keep programming your mind, Muhammad's a prophet, Muhammad's a prophet, Muhammad's a prophet. For years and years and years, uh, you can see why they have this reaction. It's because all their lives, every single day, they've been repeating this Shahada that Muhammad is the Rasulullah, that he's the messenger of Allah. And so when, they, when they're confronted with this, and, and you notice, David, what we've been quoting is what? The Islamic sources. Mm -hmm. In other words, you got to contend with Bukhari. you got to contend with Muslim. you got to contend with Abu Dawood. you got to contend with Ibn Majah. you got to contend with the Quran. So if you notice, David and I, I mean, we have seldom been quoting from the Bible. We're going to your primary sources. And if your primary sources are telling this about your prophet, uh, what does that say? Um, and, and so if you're going to get upset with us, don't get upset with David or I. you got to get upset with what, what Bukhari taught, what Muslim taught, what your Hadith collectors taught, what Ibn Ashaq said, and, and ultimately what your prophet did and said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. Our Muslim friends, uh, we're looking forward to having uh, this discussion with you uh, right now. Um, here's a here's a sort of related note. Um, it's kind of a kind of on a slightly different angle than we're than we've been talking about, but related. And we we always want to answer questions about helping uh, helping Muslims, Christians helping Muslims. So Mark here says, uh, "Hello, Tony and David. I had a question. I approached my Muslim friend with Muhammad and his child bride." But he said the hadith is wrong because Muhammad never entered the city, uh, the city she lived in till she was 18. You, yeah. you familiar with any hadith claiming that, Tony? No, no, other than the revisionist books that Muslims are trying to put out there. But no, I don't know of any, any, I mean, this is like earlier, uh, David, I was talking about the, uh, the, Hadith and the Sirah, where, where it talks about Muhammad wanted to kill himself. In my last debate with Shabir, I was absolutely shocked when Shabir said, well, that Hadith's not right, uh, mm -hmm. that we can't accept that as, as authentic, because if it contradicts the Quran, we can't accept it. Well, you've just thrown the whole Sunni tradition out the window, because the whole idea of being a Sunni, what is Sunni? It comes from the word Sunnah, which means the model of the Prophet, the way of the Prophet. Well, if you start throwing out the Hadith, you might as well be a Quran-only Muslim, mm -hmm. a Qurani. And, that, that, um, and, that, so, and that, that's the direction Shabir's been heading for years, right? Exactly. He's, getting, he's been he getting closer and closer to that. He's getting closer and closer. And he's even got to the point where in his last debate in Toronto with my good friend, uh, uh, Pastor John Torres, he actually said that Muslim can believe that Jesus died and rose again and still be a Muslim. So this is, this is how far off the field Shabir has gone from, from the Sunni tradition. And I mean no ill towards him. Uh, I'm just saying that that he has definitely moved away. Mm -hmm. um, so think about it, Muslims. When when someone like Shabir Ali, uh, who was respected as one of the leading apologists, is is throwing Bukhari under the bus, what does that say? Think about the ramifications of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Mark, uh, Mark, uh, here's a, here's a good little habit to get in. Um, when you go up to your Muslim friend and you're going to present some some sources, have have the sources ready, right? And we just we just put multiple we just put multiple sources up on the screen. It's very easy. Notice, notice what your friend said. He said the hadith is wrong. The the hadith. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of hadiths about Muhammad having uh, having a nine year old child bride. There is none that say that Aisha was eighteen. She was eighteen when Muhammad died. She was 18 when Muhammad died. He'd already been having sex with her for nine years, according to the sources. So a good habit, if you're, if you're in this situation, find out ahead of time which sources your friend believes in. So find out if he's Sunni or Shia or whatever. Um, and then bring the sources to him in uh, of the sources that he said he believes in, right? Bring those sources to him. And say, it says right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, and right here that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl. And when he says, no, 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 my good man, Muhammad never even entered her, entered that city. <laughs> even though this, this was Abu Bakr's daughter. This is Muhammad's best friend's daughter. 
You telling me Muhammad didn't enter Mecca until Aisha was 18? It doesn't even make any sense. It that none of that makes any sense. So when your friend makes that kind of claim, you have to say, okay, show me that. Show me that in your source where Muhammad never entered Mecca until Aisha was 18 years old. Notice there were two different cities. There's Mecca and Medina, right? Aisha, Aisha's there in Mecca, and later she's in later she's in Medina. It makes no sense. By the time, again, by the time she's 18, Muhammad's dying. So none of the, that timeline certainly doesn't make sense. So that's uh, that's the kind of direction you want to go. All right, Tony. So we talked uh, we've talked a little bit about the spiritual issues. Up, oh, we have a ton yeah. of we have a bunch of super chats. So we're gonna want to get to them in a second. But um, we talked a little bit about the spiritual problems Muhammad had, and mm -hmm. and it's not just the ones we mentioned. That we, you could uh, you could mention far more. I mean, just if you if oh, you yeah. if you go through the way he received his revelations, we did talk about Muhammad's first revelations that he thought it was demonic. But even later, right. I mean, it, later if you just read about how Muhammad would receive these these revelations from the Quran, it sounds like something out of the exorcist, not like what we find among the biblical prophets. So that's another difference. Right. That's another difference right. between Muhammad, right. Muhammad and everyone else. But there is one more issue that that uh, I'd like you to comment on. Um Given what the gospel of Jesus is, the gospel that was brought by Jesus, and the fact that we are we are taught that false prophets and false teachers are going to come and they're going to corrupt that message, and that we're repeatedly warned by Jesus and his followers that false prophets are coming, that they're going to corrupt that message, how much does Muhammad look like a false prophet from the perspective of these earlier prophets and then of course the lord jesus christ how much and the apostles as well how much does muhammad look like a false teacher and a false prophet by the standard of those who came before him because our muslim friends are saying they respect those guys before them and so if they respect those guys before muhammad then they should be asking well how does muhammad line up with what they said right well he fails uh, absolutely fails because the early christians made it very clear that the heart of the gospel was number one the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. Uh, number two, they they made it also a cardinal truth that the incarnation, uh, whoever denies that Jesus has come in the flesh, and the context has to do with the word becoming flesh, the word who was God becoming flesh, is antichrist. Whoever denies the Father and the Son is antichrist. Um, and so a denial of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is another gospel, which the Bible calls anathema in Galatians 1, 6 to 9. Whoever preaches a gospel other than the gospel that the apostles preached, the, that message and that messenger is anathema, even if it's an angel, even if it's a messenger. Isn't it interesting, David, that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 3 to 4, when Paul talks about those who bring another Jesus, who preach another Jesus, another message, another gospel, have another spirit, isn't it interesting, David, that in verses 13 to 15 of 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says, for such men are false apostles, mm -hmm. deceitful workmen. I want you to catch what Paul says there. False mm -hmm. apostles. Now, did Muhammad claim to be an apostle? Mm -hmm. Yes. The yep. word Rasul in Arabic means messenger or apostle. That's why some English translations of the Quran translate Rasul as apostle. And in Greek, apostolos means one who was sent. So when we look at what the apostles of Jesus wrote, and we have their writings, what they wrote in the first century as eyewitnesses contradicts everything Muhammad came to bring. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the divine Son of God. He is God himself in the flesh, God the Son, second person of the Trinity. Jesus Christ is the, the, the crucified and risen Savior. This, David, is the heart of the gospel. And if you notice, we don't want to go there because this is not the topic of our, of our discussion tonight, but when the Quran comes out and denies the crucifixion and the death of Jesus, it immediately attacks his resurrection, because you can't have a resurrection without death. And so what you find from the get-go is Muhammad, uh, you know, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, uh, and walks like a duck, it's a duck. Muhammad passes all of the traits of a false prophet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's why, and that's why Christians from the get go rejected him. Yeah. And so, uh, what we have here is a interesting situation where Muhammad comes along. Muhammad comes along, and it seems like he's agreeing with a lot of what 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 Christianity teaches. But you know, we go back to the Book of Acts. Um, we can see. I mean, the the, the apostles spent. Uh, a 
spent a few years with Jesus, learning from Jesus. Jesus taught them all kinds of things, but they knew when they when they took that message to the world, the gospel, the good news, was a message about Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity. And uh, Muhammad comes along. We're told that false prophets are coming. Muhammad comes along and he says, uh, hey, you Christians, you believe in God? So do I. You believe that Jesus is born of a virgin? So do I. You believe he performed all these miracles? So do I. You believe he's the word? So do I. You believe he's the Messiah? So do I. You believe that, that, that he went up to be with God? So do I. There are just these three little things, just these three little things that we have to get, we, we have to correct. Uh, one, he didn't die on the cross for sins. Two, he didn't rise from the dead. And three, he's not Lord. Now, if we, if we can get past that, then we're, we're, we're good to go. We're, we're golden. The Christian response should be, my goodness, have we been waiting for you? Because you're not just, you're not just a false prophet. You are like the epitome of a false prophet, according to the Bible. So, Tony, when we combine that, when we combine that, and of course, of course, uh, you know, we're, as you pointed out, we're warned about false apostles and so on. Paul warned us that Satan can masquerade as an angel of light. And what was Muhammad's first impression? His first interpretation of what appeared to him in the cave? He thought it was demonic. He thought he was right. demon possessed. And I just have to say, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes your first impression is the correct one. But Tony, when we combine Muhammad, uh, what happened to him with uh, what happened to Muhammad uh, in the cave and uh, him becoming suicidal, depressed and suicidal, him delivering uh, verses that promote polytheism, him claiming that he's a victim of black magic, a magic spell that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. Even according to the satanic verses story, Muhammad could not tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from, from the devil. And then even in the, the descriptions we have of him receiving his revelations, again, it sounds like something out of a horror movie out of a horror movie about demons. That's what it sounds like when Muhammad's receiving his revelations. When we combine all of that with the fact that all the prophets up up through, through the entire Bible and then uh, everything culminates with Jesus Christ and then his apostles carry the message out, everything is pointing towards the gospel and these same, these, these same apostles warn us that False prophets, false apostles are going to come. They're going to corrupt what everything in the Bible has been leading up to. Muhammad comes along, does exactly what they said. When we look at all of that, does it look like there are dark forces at work, like there are demonic forces at work, and that that Muhammad isn't just getting these from his own mind, perhaps, but all, but even getting them from uh, from darker forces, which are using him as a kind of puppet. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. The moment, the moment, David, that he acknowledges that Satan himself threw in words while he received the message, and that he credits Satan with with confusing him with the satanic verses, then the gig is up. Mm -hmm. uh, and and one of the things we can also discuss, David, as you know, is that Muhammad also led his people into idolatry, and we mm -hmm. know that that the prophets of God. Uh, do not lead God's people into idolatry. It's the false prophets. Uh, Jeremiah 23, it's the false prophets who led the people of God into idolatry. But take, for example, the, 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 in, in the Quran, in Surah 21, uh, 66, we've got the story of Ibrahim, of Abraham, and how Abraham uh, denied the, the, the idols of his father, and how uh, Abraham would say to his people, can these things help you? Can, for example, 2166, what do you then serve besides Allah? What brings you not any benefit at all, nor does it harm you? And then what we find is that Muhammad goes to the Kaaba um, while it even while it still has the idols, the 360 idols inside. Muhammad goes to the Kaaba and circambulates the Kaaba. He goes around the Kaaba and then he kisses and smooches the black stone at the corner of the Kaaba. It was so shocking that Omar himself mm -hmm. said, and I'm quoting here from Sahih al-Bukhari, Volume 2, Book 26, Number 679. It says here, I saw Umar bin al-Khattab kissing the black stone, and then he said to it, had I not seen Allah's apostle kissing you, I would not have kissed you. So now you have this prophet who is supposed to be a prophet of Tawheed, no idols, and here he has the, his people going around a, a shrine of the Kaaba, which was a, a pagan rite long before Muhammad. And he did exactly what the pagans have been doing for centuries, 
kissing and caressing a black stone. Many of our viewers, David, probably don't know that the Islamic sources say that that stone will actually talk mm -hmm. on the day of resurrection and will bear witness before Allah that this Muslim came and smooched me and hugged me. And so if that is not idolatry, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. um, so we always hear Christians say, you, you, uh, Muslims say, you Christians are cross worshipers and you worship the cross. You know, I have a cross around my neck. You have one as well, David. We don't worship the cross. The cross is merely a symbol of the sacrifice that Christ gave. But David and I are not going around smooching and kissing our crosses. But our Muslim friends, when you do the Hajj, you know that one of the principal things you do when you circambulate the Kaaba is you go to that stone and you kiss it and you caress it. That, my friends, is idolatry. Mm -hmm. And if a prophet leads you into that type of practice, that is no different than the Israelites in Exodus 32 worshiping and serving the golden calf. Mm -hmm. No different. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, Tony, um, since we're since we're talking about uh, and since our, our, our Muslim friends are saying that they respect the prophets who came before uh, Muhammad and so on, uh, just just let me know what you think. Um, mm -hmm. If Muhammad had existed during the time of Moses and had come along claiming to be a prophet, saying, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Moses, I'm another prophet just like you. I'm a prophet of the one true God. And I've been sent with revelation saying that we need to kiss this stone. We need to, we need to, we need to come and, and smooch this black stone. And it's going to, uh, it's it, it, on judgment day, it's going to, it's going to reveal that it's actually alive and it's going to intercede for us and testify on our behalf. And oh, by the way, I also received revelation saying that we can pray to pagan goddesses. We can pray to a lot, a loose and manat. And they'll, these, these bird goddesses will carry our prayers to the great God Allah. If Muhammad had come along during the time of Moses saying, Moses, I got these revelations. What do you think? Uh, how do you think Moses would have responded? Would he have embraced well, him? Would he have embraced well, him as let, a true let, prophet? Well, let me quote you. Uh, let me quote you Moses' words. So here's Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, verse 20, which Moses wrote. And this is what Deuteronomy 18, verse 20 says. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And so Moses would have had Muhammad stoned to death, right on the spot. So uh, so our Muslim friends who are claiming you respect these prophets, uh, one, one prophet that you claim you respect, Moses, would have stoned Muhammad to death for just some of the things he was doing. Um, and if, if we examine other things Muhammad did, uh, he would have been executed by quite a few people along the way, and at the very least would have been condemned by all of them. And this just goes back to what I was saying earlier. You you think you respect these earlier guys, but you only, you only believe in Muhammad. You believe what Muhammad says about all these guys. And according to Muhammad, all these guys are saying, oh, yes, we can't wait till Muhammad gets here. Yeah. And it's, you, it, it's, it's, it's just false. It's just false. Those actual guys would have either killed him or condemned him. So, all right. Well, Tony. Uh, matter of fact, let me go. Let me go through a, a couple of the super chats here because there there have been a bunch here. Sure. Uh, Lisa Look says Jesus loves us. Amen. That's true. Um, Amelia uh, has posted several comments. Uh, the most recent one I wanted to look at. Uh, Amelia said, she sort of added to the list I was making, but she said, why is Jesus the judge on Judgment Day? Why not Muhammad or Allah? Very fishy, isn't it, Muslims? Guess Muhammad is not the last uh, prophet or antichrist. Um, of course, in, in Islam, Allah is going to be the judge, but Jesus does return. He does actually come back uh, to, uh, he, he comes back and regulates on the, on the entire world. And so... Um, Yes, yeah, so you can add that to the list of why is Jesus. See, our point here, our point here, our Muslim friends is you say, oh, uh, we, we, there's no distinction among the prophets. And yet Jesus, born of a virgin, performs all the miracles. Um, he's the Messiah. He's the word of Allah. He's, uh, Allah won't let him die. Tons of prophets died, even according to, uh, to Islam. Uh, Allah wouldn't even let him die, took him. And then Jesus is returning to uh, rain down Allah's wrath on the world. He's going to break all the crosses. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna kill all the pigs and all kinds of things. So why is Jesus so incredibly different if he's just like everyone else does not make a lot of sense? Um, Abdu said, did Muhammad read the scriptures? 
Well, but can't read. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> there is some there there is some debate about about whether Muhammad could actually read or not. But um, uh, no, it, it's it's more it's more likely that Muhammad uh, that Muhammad uh, would have heard a lot of what he was claiming. So he heard a lot of stuff from other people, right? So Muhammad uh, was a caravan trader before he declared himself to be a prophet. And so he's always in conversations. He knew Christians. He knew Jews. He knew heretical Christians. And so that's where he's getting a lot of his stories from. Um, super sticker from Cheryl R. Thank you. Uh, Kaffir Linder Clark says, having Islam without hadiths is like having Christianity without the words of Christ. Yes, you're, you're definitely missing something, even according to the Quran. So for people who don't know, the Quran is, is not the words of Muhammad, according to Islam. The Quran is the word of Allah. No input from Muhammad. Muhammad's just a mailman, basically. He delivers it, right? He, he gets the message and he, and he passes it on. Um, but, but the Quran says that Muhammad's the pattern of conduct for Muslims and that Muslims have to have to obey all of Muhammad's decisions. Well, Muhammad's decisions are found elsewhere. They're found in the Hadith. Muhammad's pattern of conduct is found in the Hadith. And so if you do not follow that, then you just, you, you're not even, you're not obeying Allah, according according to the Quran. Um, Basharat uh, in the super chat, thank you. Um, let's see, apostate prophet. He just, an he answered the question. He said, no. <laughs> The apostate prophet jumped in there and said, uh, "No." Um, all right, we have we have a we have a, a few more. Let's see. Paul Bishop said, "I completely agree that Muhammad is Satan, uh, Satan manifestation. What's better? Uh, what's better plan to mislead 1.8 billion people and discredit the cross and God's sacrifice, changing God's characteristics, hi uh, history, and holiness?" Yeah. So uh, lots of problems there. Um, Kafir Linda Clark said, "What convinced me Islam was from Satan." was Muslims' inability to see who Muhammad truly was. And Tony, what do you think about this? Because that's, that's kind of a side issue. I, I noticed that, and I've experienced it, right? Uh, when I was an atheist, I remember being in jail, and I wanted to learn the Bible, primarily to refute Christians, and I was reading John 1, just John chapter 1, and I read it over and over and over and over and over again, and I could not understand anything I was reading. And I was thinking, what? I mean, wait a minute here. Is this just incomprehensible? I mean, I feel like I'm a smart guy, and I know how to read, and I just could not get it. Uh, whereas later, never, never, never had that, never had that problem. And so, uh, but, but uh, Linda Clark here says that uh, what convinced her that is that there's actually a, 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 a demonic element to Islam was how it blinds. Uh, many Muslims, so that they can't even see the truth about Muhammad. So uh, what do you think about this kind of revealing a spiritual component? Yeah, you know, it's funny, David, because uh, we just mentioned 2 Corinthians 11. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, Paul says this. He says, if our gospel is hid or veiled, it is hidden by those whom the God of this age has blinded the minds of them who don't believe, so that they will not see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. And that, you know, David, that just sends chills up my spine because what it does is it confirms that the God of this age, which is a which is a term for Satan, the devil who rules this world, he blinds their minds. Notice he doesn't say that he blinds the physical eyes. It's not a physical blindness. It is a mental blindness because it is our mind. The reasoning takes place in our mental faculties. And so if Satan blinds our minds, then we cannot fully see or understand and so in, in one respect it is a fulfillment of what we see in scripture paul also says first corinthians 1 18 that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to those who are those of us who are being saved it is the power of god unto salvation so it is spiritual blindness there's mm -hmm. no other way to put it uh, jesus said no one can come to me unless the father draws him to me and i will raise him up on the last day that's john 6 verse 44 uh, and so it confirms that that there is a deception going on here, uh, and it's only a deception that only Jesus Christ can can set people free from. He said, "You will know the truth; the truth will make you free." And if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. And so that's that's our prayer and and the hope that we have through through these these uh, YouTube channels like David's is that we we will have Muslims see this glorious light, uh, the glorious light of of the gospel. Uh, that is found in Jesus Christ. So that's that's why we do what we do is because we love Muslims. We want to see them. We know what it's like to be, you know, and I'm sure you could resonate with this too, David. You know what it's like to be in the pits. You know what it's mm -hmm. like 
to be in the mire. Uh, and, and God comes and he lifts us up out of the mire. And mm-hmm. it's all by his amazing grace. Mm-hmm. And so uh, wh- one thing to keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, that our battle is not just with flesh and blood. And uh, there's, right. mo- there's more than just sharing facts. You've seen it. You've seen it over and over and over again. Uh, on this channel and in your interactions with Muslims. A Muslim can say Muhammad is the greatest man who ever lived. And then you point out that uh, if you know if you were to list the 10 worst things a human being could ever do, Muhammad did like six or seven of them. And the Muslim will still say, nope, he's the, the greatest man who ever lived. And so there is just a kind of spiritual blindness there. So while you're sharing the facts, while you're, you want to do everything you can, you want to, you want to get as much information into uh, the Muslim as you can, because we all know their leaders are keeping this from them. They're not going to hear this. They're not going to hear the truth about Muhammad from their leaders, from their families, from their communities. They're not going to hear it from politicians. They're not going to hear it from the media. They're not going to hear it from educators. They're not going to hear it from Hollywood. They're not going to hear it from anyone if they do not hear it from us. So we need to get the information across to them, but also given this level level of spiritual blindness, make sure you're praying every every step of the way. And David, if I could add something, there's mm-hmm. also, of course, I think there's an element of fear here as well. Uh, they don't want to leave because they know what the penalty is to leave Islam. And you know that the penalty uh, for apostasy is death. You know, it's interesting, the, the founder and the leader of, well, the leader, rather, of the Muslim Brotherhood, Yusuf Kardawi, has openly admitted, and it's available on YouTube, he's openly admitted if it was not for the apostasy laws, Islam would have ceased to exist Mm -hmm. centuries ago. And so I think one of the other reasons is a lot of Muslims are afraid. They're Mm -hmm. afraid that if they leave Islam, uh, the worst case is they'll be killed. Uh, There could be an honor killing, Uh, especially women. Female Muslims are are really, really vulnerable here. They can be killed in an honor killing uh, for apostasy. So... Uh, we understand, and we also know that in the early years of Islam, David, you remember that after Muhammad died, you had the Riddle Wars, uh, the wars of apostasy, where Abu Bakr goes out and people are saying, well, now that the Prophet's dead, we can just go and be whatever, you know, we can just go back to what we were doing. And Abu Bakr says, absolutely not, we're coming for you. And so mm-hmm. we had the Riddle Wars, the wars of apostasy there for a while where a lot of blood was shed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you, you mentioned how difficult this could be uh, for Women. There's a woman who lives in California. She doesn't want to. Uh, she she doesn't want this story to be right. uh, public. But um, she was in a Muslim country and converted to Christianity. Uh, her parents found out about it, and then they handed things over to her uncle to lead her back to Islam. And his solution was to gather a group of men and gang rape her and to warn her that this is what's going to happen to her repeatedly. And if you want to be uh, treated like a non-Muslim, then we'll treat you like a non-Muslim. And so uh, fortunately, she was able to get out of that country uh, and live in the United States now. But uh, yeah, bad, bad, bad situations. Um, All right, we'll take a few more questions here in a few minutes. But uh, right now, Tony, we've looked at... Uh, reasons to think that something very, very wicked is going on in the life of Muhammad and in the revelations of the Quran. But when someone claims to be receiving revelations from God, there, there's, there's, there, there are two more possibilities. One, that the person is actually getting revelations from God, and two, that the person is just sort of receiving revelations from his own mind, either deliberately or, or uh, unwittingly. Uh, It could be delusional or something like that. And uh, I don't actually see any conflict between claiming that certain things that Muhammad said or taught were influenced by demons, but others were just coming out of his mind or he's getting from the surrounding culture. So what reason, since we're exploring the possibilities here, what reason do we have to think that Muhammad is just getting revelations, not not necessarily from demonic sources, not from from a divine source, nothing supernatural, just getting revelations uh, from his own mind? Right. Well, I think we, we, we really see it in his sexual life, in his sex life. If you look at his sex life, as you know, uh, Muhammad uh, is said to have had uh, the strength of, of 30 men uh, when he had sex with all his wives in one night. And when we look at the story of Mary the Copt, uh, who was one of his uh, uh, sex slaves and whom he admired, and if you remembered, uh, he was actually having intercourse with her uh, in, in one of his uh, wife's uh, homes. And then when he was caught, he was apologetic and basically, oh, don't tell Aisha about this. And mm-hmm. it was all apologetic. 
Um, and then all of a sudden, um, he simply justifies it by saying, oh, a revelation came down. And Allah says, uh, why did you even talk like that? Who do your wives think they are talking to you like that? You have a right to, to any woman you want, and they don't have a say in the matter. Once Allah and his messenger make, some, make, uh, make their decision, no one has a right, no believer has a right to ask any questions. So I think we really see it, David, in, in Muhammad's sex life. And one of the things I like about Aisha, I don't know about you, but I've always liked Aisha. She's <laughs> yeah. a cheeky girl. She, she's, like, she's, 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 my, she's, my, she's my favorite character oh, yeah. in, in the Muslim yeah. sources, yeah. Yeah, she's, she, it's almost like she was there to prepare us for what we were going to say today. Mm -hmm. But she was quite the cheeky girl. And uh, remember when she would say, it seems that your Lord always hurries to, to, to give you the revelations whenever it's convenient for you. So, and I'm surprised she even got away with saying that. But the fact of the matter is, I think you're right, David. When we look at his sex, sex life, there's no doubt about it that all of a sudden he, he looks at um, his adopted son's wife, uh, wife, as we read in Surah 33, he, he goes over there, and uh, we don't know her from the Quran. She's not named in the Quran. We know from the, the Hadith that her name is Zainab. And so when he goes over there, she comes to the door, uh, and she's not she's not fully clothed. Uh, all of a sudden, he, he, he gets all excited and says something, uh, so, some word of praise. Well, we now know later what happens is he got he got excited from seeing his his daughter in law, and um, let's let's face the facts here. He he fell in he fell in lust with her. He wanted her, and uh, and all of a sudden uh, Allah gives him another revelation. You can go ahead and tell Zaid to to divorce his wife. So I think we really see it when it comes to his sex sex life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Uh, also, uh, uh, another related note. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you are sitting there saying, hey, you know, if a man could design a religion just to satisfy himself and, you know, who cares about the women, uh, what would it look like? I think you'd get something that looks very, very similar to Islam. You can have multiple wives and sex slaves and you can trade your wives out. And if you're a total pervert and you like little girls, you can have them, too. And, you know, you go out and you fight a battle and you see a woman there, you can just snatch her, take her back to your tent and uh, have sex with her. And so you can do all these things. And then what, what, what is paradise, of course? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's Allah's great brothel in the sky, right? Uh, so certainly looks like, looks like something that uh, a man who is overcome with his, uh, with his uh, bodily desires would, would come up with. But uh, there's also the fact that if Muhammad's really receiving these revelations straight out of heaven, then there could be all kinds of, you know, information and new teachings and teachings that, you know, came from different, you know, had been revealed in different parts of the world, but were, were unknown there and something like that. But when we look at the teachings of Islam, it looks like someone took uh, certain monotheistic teachings of Judaism, which was right there in Arabia, certain heretical teachings of, of uh, the heretical Christians who were living in Arabia, uh, various pagan practices and pagan beliefs, uh, you know, like circling the Kaaba and kissing the Black Stone. Uh, looks like someone took all of the stuff that's circulating right there in Arabia during the time of Muhammad and just rolled it up into a ball and called it and called it Islam. It that's exactly what it looks like, right? Looks like someone just said, here's everything that's being taught around us. Let's just compile it into one big ball. That's what Islam looks like. And uh, one of the biggest features there, uh, Tony, is that Muhammad's got all these stories. He's got all these stories coming down and they're supposedly coming down from Allah. Hey, I received a revelation. And we know because the Quran says it over and over and over again like a beating drum, mm -hmm. Muhammad would receive his revelation. He would come up and say, ladies and gentlemen, I got this new revelation. And the people around him would go, what are you talking about? These are tales of the ancients. We know these stories. And then he'd come up with another story. And they say, what are you talking about? These are just fables. Yeah. These are fables. We all we know this, right? And so even the revelations that Muhammad is receiving the people knew this stuff the christians knew the christian stories because they're taught they're, they're talking about them the jews knew the jewish stories the pagans knew the the pagan story they all they all know this stuff that muhammad is spouting and a lot of these stories we know where they go back to and they don't go anywhere near uh anything remotely resembling actual historical events so what do you what do you think about this as far as as far as muhammad getting his revelations from his own mind yeah, I think Muhammad was was one of the world's greatest uh, plagiarists, uh, and the Quran is a great uh, play, work of plagiarism as well. And 
you just can't help it, David. I mean, you read the Quran and story after story, Jesus speaking from the cradle, infancy gospel of Thomas, uh, Jesus making clay birds and breathing on them and off they go, uh, infancy gospel of Thomas. Allah grabs Mount Sinai and raises it over the heads of the Jews, uh, the Jewish Babylonian Talmud. Um, the, the story of Cain and Abel, uh, where the uh, raven comes and shows Adam and Eve how to bury the body of, 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 of Abel that Cain murdered, comes from Perky Eliezer. Um, we have the, the, the story of Jana, of the paradise of the Houthis. The Zoroastrian uh, literature has uh, that picture of paradise with these damsels coming to serve you and so forth. And even, even fables like the, the, the seven sleepers uh, from Ephesus with their dog, they go into a cave and they fall asleep for a number of centuries. And then Zulkarnain, uh, my heavens, now Alexander the Great is a Muslim. And, and these stories of Zulkarnain uh, were very well attested among the Greeks uh, before the Quran was made. And so, so it's come to a point where all you see is nothing new. And, and when the Quran says in Surah 25 that, the people of Muhammad's day, they said, listen, Muhammad, we've heard all this before. There's nothing new here. And then Muhammad says, uh, the, uh, Allah says, no, say to them, no, this is this has been sent down. Tanzil, the, the verb that means to reveal, to send down. It's been sent down from him uh, who knows the secrets. Well, a lot of Muslims, and I, I know we've done a, a show on this before, David, but a lot of Muslims, uh, w when they say things like, like my friend Shabir Ali will say things like, yeah, yeah, of course, these stories were among the Jews. They're, they're actually going against the Quran because the Quran says the answer they're supposed to give in Surah 25 verses 4 to 6 is you're supposed to say, no, they have been revealed. They've been sent down. But we know, David, we know very well that these things were commonplace. Muhammad heard these. These were it was an oral culture. Uh, he heard these stories. He didn't know that the story of Jesus was talking from the cradle. He had no idea that it was in the infancy gospel of Thomas or that Mary was given over to the temple and she was fed by angels. He didn't know that that was recorded in the second century uh, proto-evangelium of James. Um, so there's nothing new under the sun here. Uh, so when our Muslim friends say Islam is this wonderful revelation, Muhammad came as a mercy to the world, etc., etc., we keep asking, what did he bring that was new? There's nothing new here, David, mm -hmm. other than revamped Arabic. I think I sent you that link already. But Augusta Strong said that that Islam was was basically uh, monotheized paganism. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely was. Um, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, point here is we have all kinds of reasons to believe that at least many of Muhammad's teachings are coming from his own sinful mind, uh, letting himself be completely overcome by the lusts of the flesh and then being uh, possibly the greatest plagiarist in all of history. Uh, Muhammad was Muhammad was called the ear. He was called all ears, right? Because they, he, he would repeat anything that people said to him, any story he heard, he would just uh, spout it, right? And, and even the people around him knew, look, Muhammad, you, you realize there's a difference between that story and that story, right? This story over here is like on the level of a, of a bedtime story that we tell to kids, but you think it's real. You think it's something that actually happened. Do, do you really not, can you really not tell the difference here? And again, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Quran. It's the Quran saying how people responded to Muhammad's uh, so-called revelations. And so we have every reason to think that Muhammad is getting a lot of his material just from his own mind and from from the the resources available around him when you combine that with when you combine that with muhammad um uh thinking that he's demon possessed and becoming suicidal as a result of his revelations and uh thinking that he's a victim of black magic and delivering the satanic verses and uh the stories about him receiving revelations these things st sound demonic and fundamentally dying denying the message of those who came before him Definitely looks like uh, we, 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 we're on to Muhammad, that we've got all of this figured out. Nevertheless, Tony, I have to say, I have to say, sometimes there can be evidence against a proposition, but then you find out there's even greater evidence for the proposition, right? So you could come up and say, mm -hmm. hey, here's some evidence I have uh, against this, and it may sound good, but then you might find out, well, there's even more evidence that tips the scales in the other, in the other direction. And so... 
Um, we're going to go ahead and open this up to our Muslim friends who want to give us. We've talked about our reasons for some of our reasons. We have many, 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 mm-hmm. many, 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 mm-hmm. many more uh, for rejecting Muhammad as a prophet. But we've given some reasons for thinking that his revelations are not coming from God. They're coming from elsewhere. But uh, we're going to uh, allow our Muslim friends now to give us some evidence, whatever they think is the best evidence that Muhammad is a true prophet. So here's your chance to give us evidence that will outweigh everything we just said. You got to give us some evidence to show that Muhammad's a true prophet. We know there are a lot of Muslims in the chat right now. Let me go ahead and uh, post a, a comment from a little bit earlier from uh, from Truth and Courage. Uh, Truth and Courage said, yes, he was the he is the word of Allah. He's talking about Jesus here. Yes, he's the word of Allah, a spirit created. So it's a spirit created, but he's the word of Allah. Now, now Tony, in Islam is a uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't the word of the word of God supposedly eternal? Yes, absolutely. And not just the word of God, but there are attributes that Allah has, mm-hmm. like seeing and knowing and hearing uh, and speech that are considered eternal. Now, if, if this person suggests that God's word is created, then then they're falling into the era of the the Mutazlites, or those who who said that it was created. Uh, and so, if if you're saying that the word of God was created then what you've just done is you've just reduced your God to a mute. There was a time when Allah was just a mute and he couldn't speak. So uh, that goes right against historic Islamic theology that the word of Allah, the speech of Allah is created, is uncreated. And that's why the Quran itself is believed to be, the words of the Quran are believed to be uncreated uh, and that they were in heaven before they were sent down and written down. Uh, through uh, the various scribes that Muhammad had. Yeah, so Jesus is the word of Allah. The word of Allah is eternal. Uh, you got a little problem there, because mm-hmm. now you're going to have to talk about a couple different words or something like that, truth and courage. Uh, but uh, keep in mind, the, the, the entire basis for saying that the word of Allah is uh, is eternal, right, is because you end up with some theological problems uh, if, right. you, if you say that Allah came up with this word at some point. But guess what? The same thing is going to apply to Jesus being the word of Allah. Um, then uh, truth and courage says Allah say be and he was um, well if that I pointed this out before if Allah say be and he was uh, truth and courage if you're saying that's what it means for Jesus to be the word of Allah then we're all the word of Allah because that's how we're all created according to Islam that's how Allah created a pig is a pig the word of Allah huh is a toilet the word of Allah is human feces the word of Allah are you saying that all these things are the word of Allah? Because that's what—that's how you just tried to explain away Jesus being called the word of Allah. Do you want to know why Jesus is called the word of Allah? Because Christians call Jesus the word of Allah. That is one of his divine titles. It refers to his divinity. Muhammad heard Christians calling Jesus the word of Allah. He didn't know what it means because he's mm-hmm. he's pretty clueless on religious matters. And so he started calling Jesus that as well, not realizing the theological implications. And now you're stuck with trying to understand why the Quran is referring to Jesus as the word of Allah. When even according to Islam, just like in Christianity, the word of God is eternal. You can't do it. And so you're saying, oh, it's just because Allah said be and he was, not realizing that you just made made pigs the word of Allah. All right, do you see a problem here? There's no way out, there's no way out of this truth and courage. It's just a mess. It's a mess created by your prophet because he didn't know what he's talking about. Uh, then finally you said the angel Jibril is the holy spirit. Um well, then you just deified the <laughs> you just deified the angel Gabriel. Uh Tony, isn't it right that in Islam, according to the Quran, Allah breathes out the spirit. He breathes out the spirit, yes. breathes the spirit. So the spirit the spirit is not like other angels, right? Other angels, Allah right. says, you know, you, you be, you be. When he creates, he, he, he fashions, he fashions man, then breathes the spirit into him. So if the, if the spirit, if the spirit is breathed out by Allah, then the spirit originates from within law, within Allah. And the same reasoning that, uh, that caused Muslims to say that the Quran is eternal because there can't be this change in Allah if he's if it's if it's his speech he has to be doing it from all eternity well then the bre- right. the breathing out of the spirit would have to be from all eternity and now we've got a exactly. divine angel Gabriel as well oh my goodness right right wow. we run into major 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 problems here David because nowhere does the Quran say the angel Gabriel is is the Holy Spirit that that develops later in Islam mm-hmm. that that that's a theological development but nowhere does it say it's Gabriel they're assuming it's Gabriel because uh, this spirit appears as a man 
And so they're saying, oh, that's Gabriel. No, the spirit, as you rightly said, the Ruh Allah, the spirit of Allah comes from Allah. And what does the spirit do, David, when he meets Miriam, the mother of Jesus? And I, I'm going to have to be a little graphic here, and you know what I'm going to get at, David. You've been there before. You've discussed this before. But it says that we breathe of our spirit. Remember when he appeared to Mary, it says that Mary covered herself. Uh, the, the Arabic word there means to cover her private parts. Mm -hmm. and, and then it says we breathed into her. In other words, he breathed his spirit into Mary's vagina yep. to impregnate her. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we got some serious problems here because if this is an angel, then that means you've just given Gabriel the power to procreate life just by breathing on someone. Mm -hmm. That's only something God's spirit can do. And that agrees with the Bible because the spirit of God hovers over the waters in Genesis 1, 2 and brings out life. He creates. He's God. And in Job 33, 4, Job says, the spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So uh, what we see in the Quran is we have the spirit appearing as a man, which sounds very incarnational to me. And the spirit appears as a man and it says we breathe into her of our spirit. So now we've got another problem. If the spirit is of Allah, just like his word, like his hearing, like his seeing, then that means his spirit is necessarily eternal as well. Now you've got an eternal spirit, you've got an eternal word, and you've got eternal God. And in the Bible, we understand these 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 attributes to be attributes of deity, and that's why we have the Trinitarian view of God. Yeah, and that's uh, this is why I've said before that Islam looks like it's a, a bad copy of Christianity, right? Because they want <laughs> to say, bad. yes, we have this eternal word that that uh, that uh, that Allah is is speaking, and we have this eternal spirit that proceeds from Allah, and which gives life and everything. They've they've got they they. They've got all the elements. They just can't put it together, and they'll just deny anything that, that looks like the Trinity. And then, and then they'll say, mm -hmm. "Oh no, no, the, the Spirit." And, and there, there are other problems. The Quran repeatedly says that Allah sends the angels and the Spirit. Right. So the, the Quran's drawing a distinction between angels and the Spirit, right. and yet our Muslim right. friends say, "Nope, this is the angel Gabriel." Well, fine. Saying that the spirit is the angel Gabriel doesn't do away with the problem. You've just deified the angel Gabriel, made Gabriel eternal. And he's right. the one who's breathed out by Allah, and then the angel Gabriel gives life. Uh, so the angel Gabriel, according to our Muslim friends and the Quran, is the eternal life giver in Islam. Wow! This no, this is pure monotheism, Tony. This is <laughs> this is tawhid. It's pure. It's pure monotheism. No, I no idolatry here. My yeah. goodness! All right, guys. Well, we've we've uh, we've brought those issues up, and now I don't know what's going on. I told Muslims that we'd be happy to look at their arguments does anyone see the arguments that they're giving because we're trying to be nice um we're trying to be generous here we know that we've raised a lot of issues and we are happy to give our muslim friends uh tony uh do, can you see the comments tony no okay so you're not looking at okay no i don't see, see them. them okay um then anyone uh point out point out to me who has given us a brilliant argument for Islam, because we want to discuss them. If there's some argument or some evidence, uh, we're happy to look at it. And if not, if Muslims can't come up with something, my goodness, guys, what are you doing here? What are you doing here if you can't come up with a, a single argument for your prophet? But if you can't, we could just talk about some some of the uh, some of the more common ones. Um, hmm. I'm. Uh, I'm looking. Guys, we've got some problems here. I'm going to have to start talking here in a second. I'm looking. Muslims, where are you at? Wait, oh, hold up. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, we, we have a comment here from uh, uh, Muhammad Abdullah. This is not really giving us an argument. He's in a discussion. Uh, but Muhammad Abdullah said, yes, it did continue to exist like many other social evils. That doesn't mean Prophet Muhammad promoted slavery. In fact, he abolished slavery in every possible way. Well, one possible way to abolish slavery would be abolishing it. Uh, Muhammad, and I mean your prophet Muhammad, Muhammad Abdullah, your prophet bought, owned, sold, and traded black African slaves. Um, he had sex with his female slaves. Um, and you can read, I mean, my goodness, go to my, go to my video, Muhammad, the white prophet with black slaves. It's filled with Muhammad having black slaves and those slaves eventually dying and then Muhammad eventually died. Muhammad could have freed all those slaves 
at any given time. He didn't. He could have freed them. We even have we have passages where Muhammad is is uh, is is buying a slave for other slaves because there'd be a Muslim slave who's being, uh, you know, who, who who wants his freedom or something like that. Muhammad would buy that slave with other slaves, with black slaves that he was selling because it's an Arab it's an Arab convert to Islam. He wants to buy that slave. Say, so I'll give you these two black slaves for that slave. Well, what's he doing? Why didn't he free that? Why didn't he free his two black slaves and give the guy money? So Muhammad, where are you getting this from? You're not getting this from your sources. Yes, it can be a good deed in Islam to free a slave. If you've committed some sin, you want to make up for it, you can go free some Muslim slave or something like that. You can do a good deed like that. But claiming that Muhammad abolished slavery in every possible way while buying, owning, selling, and trading black African slaves and having sex with his female slaves is beyond delusional, my friend. So, um, no, no, hey, Muhammad Abdullah. Man, I'm I'm a laid back dude. So if you want to if you want to have a special live stream on Muhammad and slavery, and you want me to pull up passage after passage after passage after passage, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm here for you. I'm here to correct your falsehoods. But guys, just Tony, have you noticed that whenever Muslims are talking about their prophet, they're saying something that's false? Yes, no. all the time. No, uh, no, no. Aisha had reached puberty. Uh, why do all of your sources say the opposite? Ah, you can't trust all those sources. Well, what are you trusting? You're just you're trusting your own imagination here? Ah, Muhammad abolished slavery in every possible way. And why did he buy, own, sell, and trade black African slaves? Ah, uh, uh, er, um, never read those. <laughs> of course you didn't. You listen to what other people say. My goodness, what do we have to do to convince you to read your sources for once in your life and stop believing the people who lied to you? Tony. Well, you know, David, it gets worse. It gets worse because Muhammad said, if you want to know what the devil looks like, uh, he had a black slave, a very a strong black slave with flowing hair Nabtal, and, and reddish and Nabtal, reddish eyes. Nabtal yeah. bin, bin al-Harith, yeah. That's right. And he says, if you want to know what the devil looks like, look at him. Mm -hmm. And so what does he say? If you want to know what the devil looks like, look at that black slave of mine. That's what Satan looks like. And, and, you know, David, it, it gets worse. I mean, he even gave nicknames uh, to his slaves. One of them was called the ship because he was known to carry a lot of mm -hmm. baggage on his back. S Safina, yes, yeah. on his back. He gave him a nickname, the, the ship. And, and even after Muhammad died, what did the caliphs do? What did uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, uh, Uthman, and Ali, what did the rightly guided caliphs do everywhere they went when the Islamic conquest began? They took slaves. Mm -hmm. They enslaved. And uh, a lot of folks, while they're berating the West for the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, what they never seem to realize is that um, Christians were the first to abolish slavery with William Wilberforce in England, and then of course with Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Act in the United States. But it's interesting that uh, Islam continued uh, to practice slavery, and no one talks about, David, the Eastern slave trade, where the Eastern African slave trade, where 140 million slaves were taken by Muslims and transported to Arabia. Many of them died along the way. Women were taken as concubines. The men were castrated. And even today, the Arabic word for a black man, you know what it is, David? The Arabic word for a black man is abd. It's the word slave. Uh, and so in many Muslim countries today, even though on paper they said we have stopped slavery, it still goes on in Libya, the Sudan, in Mauritania. It is still, even in Saudi Arabia, they treat uh, maids as slaves, and they think they can have sex with them based on Surah 4, verse 3. Mm -hmm. And so what we find is that Islam, by its very nature, David, what is Islam about? It's submission. It's slavery to whom? It's slavery to Allah. And so the paradigm in Islam is master-slave. You're the slave, mm -hmm. Abdullah, the slave of Allah. And so slavery is in, it's ingrained into Islam. Uh, but in Christianity, what do we find? God comes to us in Jesus Christ, and God says, I'll be your father, and you shall be my son, you shall be my daughter. Think about that. We have a familial relationship with God. We can call him Abba, the way Jesus called him Abba, our father in heaven. In Islam, it's all about this master-slave relationship. It's about this dominance that takes place, and that trickles down into society. Uh, the way Muslims treat, for example, Arabs, the way Saudi Saudi Muslims treat Pakistanis is just disgusting. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a video of a Saudi uh, in, a, in a taxi cab uh, driven by a Pakistani Muslim, and he's telling this Pakistani Muslim to kiss his feet because mm -hmm. he was an Arab from Saudi, where the, whole, the country of the Prophet and so forth. 
There is a lot of racism that goes on there. I'm not excusing that there's no racism among so-called Christians, but the idea of slavery is ingrained in Islam. It's all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, again, that's that's Quran, that's Hadith, that's Sirah. Um, yeah. They would take uh, females uh, captives as sex slaves, uh, take them back, uh, rape them, then go to the next town and and sell the women for for weapons. And some, right. somehow, somehow, uh, the, the 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 greatest man in history, the pattern of conduct for for everyone. Again, admittedly, acknowledge, hey, you can you can free a slave um, as a good deed. Um, uh, Muhammad's adopted son was a freed slave, although later he wasn't his adopted son anymore. Uh, so you, you can do that, but to, to, it's, it's like, it's like Muslims always do this. They'll take anything, right? Like, oh, so-and-so liberated a slave. Muhammad abolished slavery. They have to like exaggerate it to an insane degree. Yeah. Muhammad, he abolished slavery in every possible way. Meanwhile, he had dozens of slaves. He had dozens of of slaves, they're listed. You can read. You can read the Muslim sources, yeah. and you can read Muhammad's slaves listed. Yeah. Um, and it's part of it's part of the Sharia, isn't it, David? If you read the Reliance of the Traveler, there's there's information in there on Sharia law and slavery. So mm -hmm. uh, the schools of Islam recognize slavery as part of Sharia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but somehow, somehow, uh, nope, we're all getting it wrong. Muhammad abolished. Do you know what abolish means, right? <laughs> Freeing a slave for some reason, for some good deed, it's not abolishing slavery, right? There were there were in in the United States when you had when you had uh, uh, the slave trade and so on. There were people who freed slaves. There were people who freed slaves. That happened. That was a thing. They say, "Oh, I'm going to free a slave." That's not the same thing as abolishing slavery. Right. That didn't happen until later, and it was it was eventually abolished. Muhammad could have done it then. What? Why do you? I, I don't get it. Why do you have to say something that's obviously false? And that's very easy to show is false. Why do you do it? Why why do you have to make things up? I'll give you I'll give you another example here. <laughs> this is from uh, 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 J uh, Jabir Ibrahimi. David, why Christians steal the Allah's Injil and corrupted and made Bible? So Christians stole Allah's Injil and corrupted, corrupted it, and then made the Bible. Uh, oopsie, uh, problem, uh, <laughs> Jabir, is... Um, uh, Surah 18, verse 27, Surah 6, verse 115, say no one can change Allah's words. You just said that Allah's a big, fat liar. You just said it. You just said he's a big old liar. Right? Allah says no one can change my words, and Jabber comes here. I gave you the references. You're not giving any references. But Jabber comes here and says, uh, nope, the Christians took it, and then they changed it. And Allah was just helpless. He couldn't do anything about it. And totally opposite of what the Quran says. Uh, but you also have other problems. According to Surah 7, verse 157, Christians still had the Injil... During the time of Muhammad, they still had it. Said they were reading it and finding these references to Muhammad. Well, wait a minute. We know what the gospel that came from the first century and, and still existed in the seventh century. We know what that gospel said. We have copies of it before that time. We know what the Injil said. That's the Injil that Allah is affirming. And that's the Injil that you just said is a corruption. So now you're saying it's corrupted, but Allah says it's the word of God. So you just called Allah a liar once again. Uh, in Surah 5, verse 47, Allah says, let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. So Allah commands us to judge by the gospel. This assumes we have it, and yet you're saying Christians stole it and corrupted it, and now we don't have it. Oh, what's that mean? You're, you're calling Allah a liar once again. Uh, Surah 5, verse 68, Allah says, let the people of the gospel, uh, I mean, uh, uh, verse 68, uh, he says that it, Christians and Jews have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel, the revelation that has come to us. So Allah says we have no ground to stand upon. And he's talking, he's speaking in the 7th century. This is in the 7th century. We know what the gospel said in the 7th century. You're saying it's it's all wrong. Allah's saying we have no ground to stand upon if we don't stand upon that. So you're calling your God a liar over and over and over again. And here's what I actually wanted to get to. Um, uh, here's what I actually wanted to get to, uh, Tony, because uh, Sabir followed it up. <laughs> Sabir said, uh, the Quran also says the Bible was corrupted. So we're fine with what the Quran says and logic. Uh, Sabir, where does the Quran say that the Bible was corrupted? Now, let's go ahead and let, let's go ahead and deal with the, the gospel first, because the Quran refers to, refers to two separate books, Torah and the gospel. Show us the verse that says the gospel has been corrupted because that's what Jabber just said. Jabber says our, our gospel has been corrupted. The Injil has been corrupted. Chapter and verse that says the gospel has been corrupted by Christians. Chapter and verse. So go ahead. And what, what do you think about all this, Tony? 
Well, I mean, it, it gets worse, David, because the Quran is, is ends up burying them. Mm -hmm. uh, Surah 10, Ayah 94, Surah 10, verse 94. Mm -hmm. uh, Allah yeah. says to Muhammad, <laughs> if you are in doubt about what we have revealed unto you, go unto the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book, who've been reading the book before you. Why would Allah direct his favorite last day prophet to corrupted scriptures? Why would he send them to the people who possess corrupted, corrupted scriptures to verify his revelation? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Of course, Allah is going to send his most trustworthy prophet to go to people who could verify what he has with verifiable scripture. So now is he not just insulting Muhammad, he's insulting Allah as well. And you're absolutely right, David. If Allah cannot change his word, no one can change the words of Allah. You've just shown, and the Quran says this is the supreme triumph, that no one can change the words of Allah. Why is it the supreme triumph? Because man cannot tamper and man cannot corrupt God's word. But well, what mm -hmm. the Muslims are now doing is they're showing it's not, the Quran is not a supreme triumph. It's a, tr it's a supreme failure. Mm -hmm. And so, it, it just, you know what it is, Dave? They keep digging themselves deeper and deeper and deeper every time they bring out these unfounded accusations. Yep. And uh, we, we got the response from Sabir. He says, Allah says that they substituted the word of Allah with their own words. Also, they had a prophet to tell them which was which. Uh, Sabir, I said, chapter and verse, and you have to show us that this is talking about the gospel, the Injil. The Quran refers to the Injil a certain number of times, and you're showing us that Allah says that the word has been changed. And notice, if you can, then you're going to have a big contradiction on your hand because Allah says no one can change his words, and you're saying it here. But go ahead and show us chapter. I'm saying chapter and verse because if you if you if you if you give me chapter and verse, I'll pull it up. We'll, we'll actually look at what the passage says. So, being being generous here, and so you, you're going to find us a passage that says uh, Allah revealed the Injil, but those Christians, man, they corrupted it. We're looking for something like that. We're looking for something like that. Show us where that is. Happy to look at it right now. So give us a reference. Uh, in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime, while we wait for that, Tony, uh, we'll get back to that issue. But notice, these three were all back to back. There was uh, Jabber's comment, Zareda's comment, and Sabir's comment. All of them completely false according to their own sources, right? So the claim that uh, you had the claim... Jobbers claim that uh, Christians took Allah's Injil and corrupted it, completely contradicted by the Quran itself. Uh, Sabir's mm -hmm. comment that, uh, that the Quran says that our Bible's been corrupted, totally false, according to the Quran. And Zareda's comment here, all back to back, the Quran is perfectly preserved. So I guess this was when we were asking for the miracle of Islam, right? Like, like show us what evidence you have that Islam is the truth. We've looked at a bunch of reasons for doubting Muhammad, for not trusting Muhammad. Mm -hmm. What reason do you Muslims have to for us to think that Muhammad is speaking the truth? We asked, and apparently this is the answer, the Quran has been perfectly preserved. Do we finally have an accurate statement from a Muslim? What do you think, Tony? Yeah, no, not at all. Uh, what they're doing, David, is they're confusing assertion with evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, you can assert anything. I can say the moon is made of cheese. Therefore, the moon is made of cheese. That's, a, that's an assertion. That's mm -hmm. not evidence. And so by just saying the Quran has been preserved, you're simply parroting what you've been hearing all the time. But we're asking for evidence. Mm -hmm. Evidence. Show us the evidence that the Injil, that's the context David was quoting, show us where the Quran says the Injil has been corrupted. We're still waiting. Yeah. Um, some of the problems we have here, some of the problems we have here, uh, are one uh, and uh, I, guys just once again I mean how many times have I said please read your sources what do you find if you go to Sahih Muslim you find Abu Musa warning the reciters of Basra uh, stop hardening your hearts so that you don't forget even more of the Quran than we forgot and he talks about two entire chapters that are no longer in the Quran that were simply forgotten mm -hmm. by Muslims because they didn't recite them enough Aisha said that when Surah 33 was revealed, it had around 200 verses. Two thirds of that Surah is gone. It's not there. Mm. The, it, the, what, what happened to more than 100 verses that are now missing from Surah 33? Aisha also said that there was a verse about, you know, uh, breastfeeding an adult and so on. What happened to yeah. those verses, Aisha? She said she had the only copy and a sheep came and ate it. 
right? So notice, this is what you mean by perfect preservation. The, this is the miracle that, and, and here's, here's what I find interesting, Tony. Here's what I find interesting. Um, the Quran has all the features of a book that was changed repeatedly, according to the Muslim all, sources, right? Missing yeah, chapters, yeah. missing passages, missing verses. It has all the features. And yet, Absolutely. and yet Muslims say, Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. Well, what do you mean? So the, if, if you're talking about a miracle here, Zareda, if you're talking about a miracle here, what you're saying is, the Quran has all the features of a book that was changed repeatedly. Muhammad's earliest reciters of the Quran couldn't agree even on what chapters are supposed to be in the Quran. Ibn Masud said there's only supposed to be 111 chapters. Ubay mm -hmm. bin Kab said there's supposed to be 116 chapters. The Quran you have has 114 chapters. Hundreds of verses come up missing. Entire chapters come up missing. It has all the features of a book that's been changed over and over and over again. And yet it's somehow been perfectly preserved even then. And so that's the miracle. The miracle is, hey, everything we know about the Quran tells us it was changed repeatedly, and yet it hasn't changed. I guess that would be a miracle if all the evidence tells us one thing, and yet, and yet the truth is somewhere else. But uh, I don't think that's the sort of miracle that's going to persuade us that we need to believe in Islam. Um, let me go ahead and pull up some passages here. All right, so we're going to get back to, uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and check out the Muslim responses. Was Muhammad? All right. So the Muslims, <laughs> the Muslims are saying two, uh, Surah two, verse two seventy. I mean, Surah two, verse seventy nine. Are you ready? Now, guys, what were we talking about? The Injil being corrupted. The Injil being corrupted. So obviously, this is going to say the Injil was sent down. The Injil was sent down, and Christians had it, and then they corrupted it, right? Because, guys, how many times does this need to happen? What true statement has any Muslim in the chat given us so far? Right? They keep posting comments. We bring up the comments, and they're completely false, right? So now, here's where, here's where they're actually going to tell the truth, right? Here's where we're actually going to look, and it's going to say that the Christians received the Injil, and then they corrupted it, right? Because that, that, was, that, was, that was the request, and, and here's where we're going to have it. Well, let me go ahead and start a little bit earlier. A little bit earlier, same chapter. Um. <clears throat> I'll go ahead and start in verse. I'm just trying to get to the uh, get to the beginning of the passage. Let me start in verse 74. Uh, then your hearts hardened after that, so that they were like rocks, rather worse in hardness. And surely there are some rocks from which streams burst forth. And surely there are some of them which split asunder, so water issues out of them. And surely there are some of them which fall down for fear of Allah. And Allah is not at all heedless of what you do. Now we get to 275. I'm including 275 because some people include this to show that uh, the Bible's been corrupted. Uh, verse 270, uh, Surah 2, verse 75. Do you then hope that they would believe in you and a party from among them used to hear the word of Allah, then altered it after they had understood it? And they know this, they know this. So they heard, used to hear the word of Allah, then they altered it after they understood it and they know this. So that's all, that's, that's often used as a claim that uh, they corrupted the Bible. Notice, it's talking about people who are rejecting Muhammad, saying they heard it and then they altered it. This obviously cannot mean, even possibly, that they corrupted the word around the world because they did not have that ability, right? So notice, even here, they're hearing it and they're altering it. They're hearing it and they're altering it. This cannot possibly mean that they have universally changed the text of the Bible, right? The, the What you have at the end of the day is that people are hearing it and they're distorting it because most people can't read it, right? So they tell people what's in the, what's in the Torah and they, uh, they corrupt the message in their preaching. But notice, the Bible, the Torah, still exists during the time of Muhammad. It's saying these people have it. These people have it, right? All right. Verse 2, verse 2, uh, verse 76. And when they meet those who believe, they say, we believe. And when they are alone, one with another, they say, do you talk to them of what Allah has disclosed to you, that they may contend with you by this before your Lord? Do you not then understand? Verse 77. Do they not know that Allah knows what they keep secret and what they make known? Verse 78. And there are among them illiterates who know not the book, but only lies, and they do but conjecture. Notice, who doesn't know the book? The illiterates. Well, what does that mean? 
it means they still have the book, right? The book that they're talking about that they're corrupting when they when they hear it and they say it means this or it means that, they're corrupting it, but they're, the book is still there, right? Now we get down to the verse in question. Surah 2, verse 79. Woe then to those who write the book with their hands and then say, this is from Allah, so that they may take for it a small price. Therefore, woe to them for what their hands have written and woe to them for what they earn. Now notice the condemnation here. And by the way, this is this is this is their this is the main one. This is their greatest word. Notice, Tony, did you hear one word about Christians or Injil anywhere in that text? None. None. Zero. So guys, what's what's he even talking about here? What's this about? Who is this about? Is this about Christians? Show me one word about Christians. Show me one word about Injil. The, the Quran repeated. The Quran repeatedly says that we have the Injil and that no one can change it. What's this talking about? Show me where this is. Show. I gave you multiple verses talking about the Injil that Christians have. Show me one word about this referring to the Injil. Now we could keep going. So verse, that's verse seventy-nine. Um, and they say, "Fire shall not touch us, but for a few days." Say, have you received a promise from Allah? Then Allah will not fail to perform His promise. And or do you speak against Allah what you do not know? Um, we're going to keep, we're going to keep going a little, a little bit more. We're, we're looking because guys, we're trying, we're trying to get the context here. We want to know, is this talking about, uh, talking about Christians? Uh, verse 81, yea, whoever earns evil and his sins beset him on every side. These are the inmates of the fire in it. They shall abide. Um, I'm looking, I'm looking, not one word guys. Uh Oh, uh Oh, I see children of Israel. I see children of Israel in, in verse 83. Oopsie. Guys, so Muslims, I'm going to go back and look at the chat. Muslims, show me where this is talking about Christians. And and by the way, just long story short, and by the way, I'm ha I'm happy to do an entire live stream on this. We I, I will gladly, gladly, gladly do uh, an entire live stream on this. Do you know what this passage is about, guys? This is not according to me. One, this is talking to this is talking about Jews. This entire passage right here is talking about Jews the Jews who were rejecting Muhammad as a prophet. It's talking about them. That's the passage. So we, we challenge Muslims. Hey, you're claiming that according to the Quran, the gospel has been corrupted. Show us one verse, one verse. They say, and the only verse they go to is a verse that's about Jews, <laughs> right? The only verse they could go to. Why? Well, th that should tell you that their best verse has nothing to do with the gospel, right? But even if you go to the Muslim commentaries, if you go to the Muslim commentaries, do you know what that verse means? According to Muslim sources, according to Muslim sources, according to Muslim commentaries, this referred to uh, the Jews supposedly being aware that the Torah talks about Muhammad. So they, they, they know that the Torah is, is talking about Muhammad as a prophet. And so what they did was they wrote something they wrote something that denied Muhammad, and then they went and claimed that it's it's in the Torah. That's what this is about. That's the historical background of that right there. The historical background is that in order to deceive some people from, from realizing that Muhammad's in the Torah, some Jews wrote a false description of a prophet to come, but made it sound so that it's clearly not like Muhammad. And then they went and said, "You see, this is what this is what this is what uh, the prophet said about the prophet to come. It's clearly not him." Now, Tony, if someone if someone writes something down and says, "Hey, this is uh, this is from the Bible, or this is the Torah, or something like that," does that corrupt the Torah? Nope, absolutely not. Would this corrupt the Torah around the world? Because keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, we had copies of the Torah buried mm -hmm. in caves from long before this, right? We've got the Dead That's Sea right. we got the Dead Sea Scrolls that are centuries mm -hmm. before Muhammad. So that we can mm -hmm. obviously if they change something then, if they change the the Quran, I mean if they change the Bible then, then we could go earlier and find find all the differences. But uh uh so Tony if I were to sit down and if a man came up to me and he said he's a prophet and I wrote something real quick, I wrote it down. This is according to Muslim sources. I wrote something and I said, here, this is a, this is a revelation. Would that corrupt any Bible in the entire world? Nope. Would nope. it would it know. would it even possibly corrupt every Bible in the world and every Bible in history that's uh, even the ones that are buried in caves? Impossible. Uh, would this have anything to do with Christians? Nope.
Nothing at all. Guys, they gave us their best case. Yeah, look, Sabir here said, <laughs> Sabir, I don't know what to do. 279 says they write, they write with their own hands. Yes, I know. And I just gave you the historical background according to your own sources. Sabir, okay. Sabir, I'm writing something right now. I'm writing. Watch this. You ready? I'm writing something. Uh, I find you have to do this in order to get the point across. All right. Here, Sabir, I just wrote Quran chapter 115, verse 1. Muhammad was a liar. And I'm claiming that this is the Quran. It's right there. Quran, chapter one, uh, chapter 115, verse 1. Muhammad was a liar. So, if I wrote something and I just claimed that it's from the Quran, did I just corrupt every Quran in the entire world? Yes or no? Tell me. Did I just corrupt the Quran? Has the Quran been corrupted? Has the Quran been corrupted? So we, we have we have Muslims saying that the Quran has never been changed, but obviously, if I wrote something and claimed that it's the Quran, then it then I've just changed the Quran everywhere. And you Muslims, somehow right now you'll recognize how stupid that is, how completely idiotic it would be of me to say, hey, I just wrote something and said it's the Quran, therefore I've changed all Qurans and the Quran no longer exists in an uncorrupted form. You would immediately see how stupid and idiotic and ridiculous that is. But for some reason, for some reason, when your sources say that someone did that during the time of Muhammad, they sat there and said, oh, I need to come up with a false description of the prophet, so I'm going to write one. And they wrote it down. You say, oh, Torah has been universally corrupted all around the world. And for, for some reason, then you don't see how stupid it is. You don't see how completely absurd and idiotic it is to say, if one guy in one city writes something to deceive the people right around him, uh, you don't see how absurd it is to say that you've just corrupted all of the copies of the Torah all around the world. You haven't corrupted one copy of the Torah, not one. He didn't take it and then <laughs> he didn't take it. Do you have any idea how expensive and difficult it was to have a handwritten copy of the Torah? You think some morons coming along, coming along and writing this inside the Torah? No. And, and even if he did, that would change the that would change the Torah nowhere else in the world. That would not change the Torah in Alexandria. That would not change the Torah in Rome. It would change the Torah nowhere ever, except in that one area. Even if they did write in there, which they didn't. And just so you know, just so you know, long after, long after Surah two was written, Surah five was written. Surah 5, verse 43 was revealed. You know what the background of Surah 5, verse 43 is? Some Jews came to Muhammad, said, Muhammad, we need to judge a dispute. And Allah said, why do they need you when they have the Torah? Notice that makes no sense. If the Torah has been corrupted because a guy wrote something down and then all copies of the Torah were corrupted, gets even worse, gets even worse. We know the historical background of that verse. It's in Sunan Abu Dawud. The Jews came to him. Muhammad was sat down upon the judgment cushion. The judge would sit down on a special cushion. Muhammad's sitting there on the cushion. The Jews come up to him, say, judge this dispute. Muhammad says, bring me the Torah. They bring out the Torah. Muhammad says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. He gets off the judgment cushion and puts the Torah on the judgment cushion. That's your judge, Jews. Your judge is the Torah. Allah says that the Jews don't even need Muhammad. They don't need Muhammad because they have the Torah. According to you, Allah and Muhammad were both wrong. Because, the, because a guy wrote something down and that somehow instantly, universally corrupted the Torah. According to Allah and Muhammad, they didn't corrupt the Torah that was there in Medina. They didn't even corrupt that Torah. That was still the inspired, authoritative word of God that was binding upon all Jews to such an extent that they didn't even need Muhammad anymore. So look at what you're telling us. You're telling us you somehow know, based on some guy writing writing something down like this and saying, oh, uh, Muhammad's, a, Muhammad's a false prophet. And if they did this, they somehow corrupted all the Torah. But guess what? You didn't realize your God and your prophet don't know that. And so the God who revealed Surah 279 reveals much later 
The Jews don't need Muhammad because they have the Torah. That makes no sense if your God believed the Torah has been corrupted. Muhammad saying, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you, saying that to the Torah and making the Torah the judge of the entire dispute makes no sense if Surah 2 verse 279 is saying that the Torah has been corrupted. It makes no sense. So you're telling us that you know more than your God and you know more about the Torah than your prophet. You're telling us that your prophet is ignorant and your God is ignorant and that he's contradicted himself. See, look, I look at it differently. I say, okay, well, if Allah is affirming the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Torah, then he he obviously can't be saying the Torah has been corrupted in Surah 2, verse 2, Surah 2, verse 79. And then I look at the Muslim commentaries about what that means and it refers to some guy. There's a guy who sat there and wrote something and claimed that it's a it's it's about the prophet. But a Mu Muslims are so desperate to say that the Bible's been corrupted that even when we ask them about the Injil, they go to a passage about the Torah and they go to a passage that can't possibly be talking about the corruption of the Torah and they say it's about the corruption of the Torah. Guys, have we seen a single true comment by the Muslims here that we're giving an opportunity to defend their prophet? Even one. Tony, I, I just talked for like 10 minutes straight because they got me. Uh, well, that's okay. Me no, no, but, made very, no, we need to hear those <laughs> valid points that you made, David. All I right. I would just say that, I would just say this, David. I would just say that uh, uh, Muhammad showed a lot more respect for the Torah and the Injil that Muslims today do. Uh, the, the way they react to the, and the way they treat the Bible today is, is so unlike the respect and honor that Muhammad yeah, gave Mah to Mah the Torah. Yeah, Muhammad sets it on the judgment yeah. cushion and praises it. And he gets off, and he gets off of the judgment seat and puts the Torah on it, which shows utmost respect, and, and, and then speaks to the Torah. So here he is speaking to a scroll saying, I believe, in, I believe in you, and I believe in him who sent you down, who sent you down. And then, of course, you know, the Articles of Islam, uh, David, says that you have to believe in the books of Allah. Mm -hmm. Whoever denies the books of Allah is a kafir. And so... The moment a Muslim begins to say the gospel is not the word of God or the Torah is not the word of God, by their own admission, they've made themselves to be infidels, to be unbelievers. And so what we're looking for here, and I think we're, we're not seeing it, David, we're looking for consistency. We're looking for consistency. And I'll tell you why the Muslims later came to this idea. Oh, the Bible's been corrupted. I think it's fair to say, David, that if Muhammad could not read, he had no access to a, to a Bible. He could not read uh, the Old Testament or the New Testament. He simply thought the contents were there from what he heard. And it's not until much later, until you get a, a full translation of the Bible into Arabic, when Muslim scholars began to read the Bible in Arabic, and they noticed that the Bible contradicted what the Quran had said in terms of who Jesus was, his death and his resurrection. They couldn't accept that contradiction. So instead of throwing the Quran out, which was the more recent revelation, so to speak, and holding to the Bible, they concluded, well, that means there was a, there, the Jews and the Christians got together, they conspired to corrupt uh, the, the, the Bible. And, and that is laughable. I mean, someone who has worked in New Testament uh, manuscripts and, and even the Hebrew Bible, looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the Masoretic text, the, the Septuagint and so forth, the idea, the very idea, David, that there was a wholesale conspiracy for Jews all over the world to go into their Hebrew manuscripts and expunge all these references to Muhammad, or Christians to go and insert references to Jesus being the Son of God. It is so, it is beyond, it is just beyond sanity to even believe that, that they were even able to do that. So you see, unlike the Quran, as you know, David, when the Quran came to, uh, when they started uh, bringing the Quran together, there were three recensions, right? There was one under... Uh, Abu Bakr, when Muhammad died, uh, he had uh, um, Zaid put together a copy of the Quran, which to him was like trying to move a mountain. It was such a Herculean task. So he gives it with Hafsa, he leaves it with Hafsa. And then later, Uthman has another recension of the Quran. And then later, you've got Al Hajjaj under Abdul Malik, under the, the, the ruler Abdul Malik in, in, in 691. He comes out with another recension of the mm -hmm. Quran. And then he even opposed Ibn Masood to the point that he said he would have killed Ibn Masood if he had the chance. And then he said that uh, he would have actually taken a, uh, a pork rib, uh, a piece of a, of a, of a, of a pork rib to, to erase what Ibn Masood had put into the Quran. So now you got three recensions. And then you go to Egypt in 1924, 
you know, they, they made the Hofs uh, tradition, the Hofs uh, translation, the official tradition in 1924 and took all the other Qurans and submerged it. So what do we see in all of this? Perfect, preser Bakr, perfect, preser perfect, perfect preservation. Perfect preservation. That's what we see. But what you see is you see this controlling force where they're trying to standardize one version of the text and then destroy all other competing versions. Mm. The Christians never had that type of control because the moment Christianity started, they started <clears throat> they started copying the Gospels and the Acts and the Epistles, and it just spread all over the Greco-Roman world. There was no way to control the distribution and the expansion of these early New Testament texts. And so when Muslims come up with this, I'm telling you, David, it's almost like it really should be put to a movie. It's one of those greatest science fiction tales I've ever heard. I mean, it is so laughable on the face of it. I can't believe that our Muslim friends would hold to such a view. It's incredible. Yeah, uh, <laughs> check out this comment. So Jabber says, uh, why Christians have different books and God concept and Muslims have same Quran and one God. Uh, so let me get this straight. Uh, Ibn Masud had 111 chapters in his Quran. Um, Ubay ibn Kab had 116 chapters in his Quran. And uh, Zayd ibn Thabit had 114 chapters in his Quran. And you're saying uh, all Muslims have the same Quran. Notice, are you paying attention to what, what, what Tony's just saying? Uthman had all the Qurans burned to cover up all the differences. And even then it didn't work. They had to do, they had to do this over and over again. Every, every once in a while, Muslims have to get together, destroy all the other Qurans and come out with their official version and then say perfect preservation right down to the letter. Um, I don't know. What do you mean different books? You mean different different books of the Bible? Like, like uh, Gospel of John, Gospel of Matthew and so on. That's a strength, not a weakness. You got, again, you guys base everything on one guy. We have multiple witnesses. We have 40 different authors all combining into one. All these, all these prophets and messengers and so on that you say you believe in, <laughs> you don't. You make fun of what they, you say, oh, no, it's, it's all been changed. But check this out. So Sabir, Sabir said, so he goes back to 275. He says, you claimed in your explanation of 275, uh, 275 that they were only talking about it. I said they're only talking about it because that's all the that's all the verse says, Sabir. Were you paying attention? Let's go back to it right now. Surah 2, verse 75. Have you any hope that they will be true to you when a party of them used to listen to the word of Allah, then used to change it after they had understood it knowingly? Now, I want to be clear here. The reason I don't talk about corrupting a text is I'm not sure that's even talking about the Torah in that verse. I understand 270, 279, someone is claiming, a Jew is claiming that something is the word of God, right? There, one of the interpretations of that verse is that they're hearing the Quran and then they go and say that Muhammad said something that he didn't say. So that's one of those, one of the interpretations of that verse. Notice, Tony, since this verse says, it's since that interpretation, if it's correct, they're hearing the word of they're hearing the word of Allah from Muhammad, and then they go and, and make something up about it. According to Sabir, that means that the, the Quran has been completely corrupted. It's been changed. Yeah. You can't trust it anymore. Yeah. That's what yeah, he says. That's logic. That's what he yeah. said. Uh, that's what he said yeah. when he thinks it's about the Torah. Now, notice, even if we grant that this verse is talking about the Torah, we know that that, that verse 279 is talking about uh, the Torah on the most common interpretation. Even then, it's not taking a copy of the Torah and corrupting it. It's a guy writing something down. It's not according to me. It's according to your, your, this according to the traditions that go back to the time of Muhammad. Somehow, you know more, you know more than Allah, you know more than Muhammad, you know more than everyone. Um, and uh, I guess Muslims should be worshiping you because you know more than your God and your prophet. But looky here, show me one word about a text that is being altered here that people are writing down. These are people who are listening. These aren't people who, these aren't scribes who write, and they're not even people who are, who are reading. They're people who are hearing. Have you any hope that they will be true to you when a party of them used to listen to the word of Allah, then used to change it after they had understood it knowingly? They're hearing it, and then they change, you're saying, oh, but they changed it. What? They changed it, and they, they went, they took copies of the Torah and went and scratched things out and changed them, or they changed it. They went and, and talked to people. Notice, if you say this can only refer to changing a text, gosh, again, one of the main interpretations of that passage is talking about people hearing Muhammad and then and then changing it, which would mean that the Quran has been has been totally corrupted. You would never think, you would never think, Sabir, that that, ha that that would have anything to do with corrupting the Quran. And yet, if you even think that that is about the Torah, yep, that means that they not only change it, and keep in mind, keep in mind, Sabir, you're, this is what you're telling us, that people 
in Medina, people in Medina, Jews in Medina, when they wanted to change something, they somehow changed it in every copy of the Torah around the world. Because keep in mind, you, my goodness, I could sit down right now and completely rewrite the entire Quran and come up with my own edition. Have I corrupted the Quran? No. Everyone else would immediately spot my, my Quran as something that's completely different, right? The only way I would be able to do that is if I was powerful enough to gather all Qurans, destroy them all, and then issue my official Quran, which is what your third caliph did, according to your sources. There is no possible way a Jew in Medina could corrupt all the, all the Torahs around the world. It's impossible. So how can you say the Torah has been corrupted? You're saying that a Jew did it and it's magic. Does it, by the way, does everyone see this? Does everyone see that that is what he's actually, he has to claim that? That a Jew in Medina, trying to cover up something about Muhammad, magically corrupted all Torahs around the world, when even according to his own Muslim scholars, this has nothing to do with anyone changing any copy of the Torah. This only has something to do with someone writing something down and claiming that it's the word of God and making some money by it. Uh, even his own scholars reject it. And his God, who says that the Torah was inspired by him, revealed by him, that's Surah 3, verses 3 to 4, Torah and the Gospel, and who says that no one can change his words, and who even says when Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute, they don't need you, Muhammad. They need the Torah. And Muhammad swears that the Torah is the word of God, makes the Torah the judge in the dispute, and we're told that we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon the Torah and the gospel. And somehow you're saying, nope, I've been corrupted because that verse right there that even my own Muslim scholars and my God and my prophet say has nothing to do with the books being corrupted, but I'm saying it is. And notice all of this is in response to a question, show us where the gospel has been corrupted. That was their evidence. I'm, I'm, guys, I don't know about you. I'm noticing some serious serious problems in the reasoning and, and we're actually we're actually doing what Allah says uh David uh, our Muslim friends are not doing what Allah says we're actually doing we're we're we are judging by the gospel mm -hmm. we are judging by what has been revealed therein and no, notice the Quran also refers to it as uh, al-nur it refers to it as a light a light to mankind so the Torah and the Injil is a light to mankind yep. and we're just doing what Allah says we're judging by the gospel and we conclude from the gospel that what Muhammad brought was not from God. And again, why would God direct Muhammad in Surah 10, verse 94? Why would he direct Muhammad to go to the people of the book to verify his message if they had corrupted scriptures? Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't make sense. Uh, and, and so they, they they simply keep digging their graves even deeper. All right. Uh, <laughs> we got more. Tony, I did not want to go this long, but I'm just having too much fun. And we, <laughs> got so, okay. we got so many Muslims here right now. Uh, Jabber said, here we have the comment. He says, Catholic, 73 books, Protestant, 66 books, and Orthodox, 83 books. Now, before you even explain, before you explain where the uh, difference there comes in, um, one, notice, I could just, I could say right now, Ibn Masud, 111 chapters, Zayd ibn Thabit, 114 chapters, Ubay ibn Kab, 116 chapters. For some reason, Tony, they will make a claim, never bother to investigate the claim, never make any effort to understand anything they're claiming, and then especially never thinking about what would happen if they applied the exact same criticism to Islam. Again, Muhammad's earliest followers could not agree on which chapters were supposed to go in the Quran. They had different numbering systems. They had all kinds of difference, differences. Large passages were lost uh, when, the, when the Muslims who had these passages memorized died in battle. The entire reason that Muslims even have a Quran in a book is because Abu Bakr said, we don't want to lose any more using this, this horrible process of memorization. We need it in a book form. So it was put down in book form. And after that, Muslims started writing stuff down because they understood, hey, we can't lose all this stuff. And then Uthman notices that the complaints are coming in about all these differences in their Quran recitation. And he says, we need to get it all together and burn it all so I can issue an authoritative version. That's perfect preservation. That's the perfect preservation of the Quran. But Tony, is this a good response here? So notice, using Jabber's uh, argument here, that this that's what corruption means. Great, the Quran's been corrupted. Couldn't agree on what's supposed to go in there. Change repeatedly. Quran is not the word of God, according to the Muslims here in the chat. But Tony, right. is this a problem for us? No, not a problem at all. And, and a lot of it has to do with a misunderstanding of, of why we have these different booklets. So um, let me start off by saying that this only applies to what we call the Old Testament section. 
of the Bible. The Jews uh, always recognized, because the, the Hebrew Bible was, was revealed to, to the Jews in the Hebrew tongue, the Jews always recognized that they were only 22 books. Now, those 22 books come out to 39 books uh, in our English translations because of the way they arrange the books, but it's all, it's, they're all the same books of the Hebrew Bible. And the Jews believed that after Malachi, the last prophet, that the Holy Spirit departed from Israel. There was no more scripture in terms of the Jewish canon. So between the Old Testament, Malachi, and the beginning of the New Testament, we have a 400-year period. We usually call that the intertestamental period, that is between the Testaments. And during that time, there were books that were written, books like uh, Judith and 1 Maccabees and 2 Maccabees and Wisdom and um, uh, the, the Baruch and the Odes of Solomon and the Psalms of Solomon and so forth. And these books that were written were never accepted by the Jews as what we call canonical. They didn't believe that they were scripture. Now, with the coming of Christianity, when, when Christianity expanded into the Greco-Roman world, we know that uh, Jews in the Greco-Roman world who, who did not know Hebrew, they only understood Greek, some of them would read these books, but they would read them as, let's say, devotionals, the way we would read, Christians would read our daily bread or a devotional by Oswald Chambers and so forth. But they did not regard those books to be sacred scripture because they understood that the books that were sacred were those that were laid up in the temple in Jerusalem. And Josephus tells us the Jews only believed in the 22 books. Philo of Alexandria, who was a Greek-speaking Jew, a Hellenistic Jew, told us there were only those 22 books, even though he knew about the other books. He still said, in our canon, this is what we have. Now, in early Christianity, there was a lot of debate about whether we could read these books or not. The reason why those books entered into, for example, the Roman Catholic collection is because in 1546, at the Council of Trent, the church, as it was reacting to the Protestant Reformation, wanted to justify some of their positions on questions of purgatory and indulgences and so forth. And so what they did was they declared these books to be, now listen to my words carefully, they declared these books to be deuterocanonical. And deuterocanonical simply means it has a secondary status. It's not in the same level with those books, the, the 22 or the 39 books of the Old Testament. Those were proto-canonical, inspired by God. So ever since 1546, the Roman Catholic Church accepted these seven extra books in the Old Testament. Now, in the Eastern Church, the same idea, uh, the same idea evolved in the Eastern Church. But if you read people like Athanasius, Origen, uh, Melito of Sardis. Now, to our Muslim friends, this probably sounds completely foreign, but these are early Christian fathers, early Christian writers from the Eastern Church, from the Greek-speaking Church, and they all told us these books were not part of Holy Scripture. Over time, they were accepted, but they understood that these books were not on the same level with Holy Scripture. Now, as evangelical Christians or Protestants, you will notice that if you look at uh, the Bible I use or David uses or evangelical Protestants use, we only have the 39 books, the same books that the Jews have in their Bible. We don't accept those other books because they are apocryphal. Now, some Protestants like Anglicans, Lutherans, they will have them in their Bibles, but they usually have them at the end of their Bibles. And they will have a note, <clears throat> excuse me, that these books are not scripture. They're just there for devotional. Now, why do I say this? Because, you see, Muslims, you've only had 1,400 years. Christianity's been around for 2,000 years. And so this means we have to unpack a lot of this stuff, and we have to try to give answers to this. So we appreciate your questions. But the problem here is that if we're going to use that standard of argumentation, David has already made it very clear. If we're going to use that standard of argumentation, then we need to decide whether we go by uh, Ibn Masood's 111 Quran, Ubay bin Qab's 116 uh, Surah Quran, or Zaid bin Thabit's 114 uh, Surah Quran. So apples mm -hmm. and oranges, we're not talking about the same thing here. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to recap, uh, Catholics and Protestants, any disagreement on the four Gospels? Any, 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 any disagreement on the Book of Acts? Any disagreement on the letters of Paul? Any difference on the uh, letters of uh, James, uh, Jude, John, and Peter? Uh, any dis disagreement on, on the book of Revelation? 
And so what you have here that is the basis of this complaint is that the Catholic Church, uh, 1,500 years after the time of the New Testament, voted on some books as deuterocanonical, um, and these are, these are from the intertestamental period and thus have nothing to do with the history recorded of Jesus. Is that correct? And yet our Muslim friends look at this and, up oh, different Bibles can't trust any of it. And once again, never crosses their minds to say, wait a minute, when we're talking about these differences in the books of the Quran, we're not talking about something that came along 1,500 years afterwards and 1500, after 1,500 years of agreement on the text of the Bible, suddenly, suddenly we need these extra books from the intertestamental period. They're not talking about that. They're saying from the very beginning Muhammad's reciters of the Quran didn't understand what's part of the Quran and what's not, not part of the Quran. No Muslim is going to say that this is any problem at all. And yet when we can easily explain their objections to ours, uh, it'll never be enough. They'll just say, massive problem, massive problem. All right, now, Tony, we're going to have to cut it off. We're going to have to cut it off here soon. But uh, we have something by Diva Girl Love here. Um, oh, she's back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now notice. Guys, we keep we keep pointing out, and 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 you you Muslims you Muslims in the chat, keep in mind we love having you here because either you will respond to the truth and you'll actually realize that your leaders have been lying to you and you'll come out of Islam, um, or you will be used by the Lord to display the kind of spiritual blindness that we were talking about earlier, where it doesn't matter what evidence we show you, you still just cannot see. You just you just cannot see. Now look at Diva Girl Love here. She says, when Muhammad, peace be upon him, said he believed in the Torah, he meant he believed in the one who revealed the Torah, who is Allah, not the corrupted Torah. Why are you lying, David Wood? So notice, she accuses me of being a liar. And she says, what Muhammad, all Muhammad meant was that he believes in the one who revealed the Torah, not that he believed in that actual corrupted Torah. Well, Diva Girl Love, you're talking to someone who has the Muslim sources right in front of his face. So let's go ahead and read it. Anyone can look this up. This is Sunan Abu Dawud, book 38, uh, number 4434. So write that down. Sunan Abu, just type in Sunan Abu Dawud, 4434. Narrated Abdullah ibn Umar. A group of Jews came and... Now, now Tony, I went ahead and told this story from memory. I'll go ahead and read it right now. You tell me what I got wrong. Where did I, okay. where did I mislead with this? Where did I get something wrong? All right. Narrated Abdullah ibn Umar, a group of Jews came and invited the apostle of Allah to Kuf. So he visited them in their school. They said, Abul Qasim, one of our men has committed fornication with a woman, so pronounce judgment upon them. I said they came to Muhammad to settle a dispute. They placed a cushion for the, I said there was a judgment cushion. They placed a cushion for the apostle of Allah who sat on it and said, bring the Torah. Notice this is Muhammad saying, bring the Torah. It doesn't make any sense if the Torah has been corrupted. He said, bring the Torah. It was then brought. He then withdrew the cushion from beneath him and placed the Torah on it, saying, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. Now, Tony, is, when he says, I believe in you, he's talking to the Torah and no. in the one who revealed you. So he says, I believe, no. two, I believe in two things. One, I believe That's in right. you, the Torah, and in the one who revealed you. He puts, the, he puts the Torah on the judgment cushion, and this is the background for Surah 5, verse 43 of the Quran, where Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute, and Allah says, they don't need you, they, they don't need you, Muhammad, they have the Torah. That assumes that the Torah hasn't been corrupted and can still be trusted. And what do we have from Diva Girl Love? When Muhammad said he believed in the Torah, he meant he believed in the one who revealed the Torah, who is Allah, not the corrupted Torah. Why are you lying, David? Notice, I'm the liar here for saying nope. exactly what the source says, for saying exactly what the Quran says. So notice, if he doesn't really believe in, if, if, if Muhammad doesn't really believe in the Torah, then when Allah tells Jews they don't need Muhammad, the Torah is their judge, and Muhammad puts the Torah on the judgment cushion, they're all lying. Everyone's lying. I... If I'm lying by telling people exactly what they said, then they're the ones lying, and I'm just repeating the lie. I'm not lying about what the source says. I've, I said right. what, what the source says is exactly what I said. What yeah. we're, but if it's a lie, then then great. Allah and Muhammad are liars. So diva girl love. I think you just apostatized. Um, and I think she came on late, David, because if she heard you earlier, she would have heard you refer to that source. I think she just came in late. But the worst part now 
is now she's not only contradicting Allah, but she's contradicting her own prophet who said, I believe in you and I believe in him who sent you. So now what is she doing? What does the Quran say? It is not for a believer to dispute when Allah and his messenger have made a decision. It is not for a believer, a man or a woman to have any dispute therein. So Diva Girl has just gone against the Quran. And I don't know if you've noticed, but but everyone, everyone, all the Muslims here have been completely contradicting their sources. Um, even Sabir here. So, so this is Sabir again. It wasn't all corrupted, talking about the Torah, just enough to make it unreliable. The prophet would know the difference since he's a prophet. Now notice two, two things here. One, he's talking about Surah 2, verse 79. There is not one word about someone actually physically changing a copy of the Torah. It says someone wrote something and then claimed that it's, claimed that it's the book. Someone wrote something and claimed that it's from the book, right? That's not the same thing, right? I did that right here, Sabir. I wrote something and I claimed that it's the Quran. This is the Quran, Sabir. I, look, I just claimed it, right? Keep in mind, you're talking about an illiterate culture where someone, can, I could walk around. If, I, if, if, if I'm talking to people who wouldn't know the Quran from a phone book, I could walk right up to them and I say, hey, look, this, I'm quoting the Quran to you. I'm quoting the Quran. It says Muhammad was a liar. And you could probably, if you're if you're talking about an illiterate culture, if, if they believe me, then then they would believe that 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 I'm just showing them the Quran. Um, you're saying that when someone does that, they magically corrupt the Torah. They magically corrupt the entire book all around the world. And and you say not all of it, just enough to make it unreliable. <laughs> Sapir, that's not enough to. If that's all someone did, he hasn't made any copy of the Torah anywhere on the planet unreliable. Even if he, even if the passage had said he, he physically took a, a physical copy of the Torah and changed it, that still wouldn't make the Torah unreliable because every other Jew on the planet with a Torah would recognize that that's not the same Torah, right? But notice, he said it wasn't all corrupted, just enough to make it unreliable. The prophet would know the difference since he's a prophet. So notice, the Torah was corrupted enough to make it unreliable. It's an unreliable book. You can't trust it. And yet, when Jews come to Muhammad and say, Muhammad, we need you. We need you to judge this dispute. The response of your God, Sabir, is they do not need Muhammad. They have the Torah. Look at what you just said. They need Muhammad since he's no, because he knows the difference between the reliable part and the unreliable. They need Muhammad. They need him. What does Allah say? They don't need you. All they need is the Torah. You're saying Muhammad knows that this book's been unreliable. Why does he say, bring the Torah? Why does he say the Torah is the judge? Why does Allah say they don't need Muhammad? Guys, are we keeping count? How many times have Muslims contradicted their own God and their own prophet here? Uh, notice, all I do is tell them exactly what their sources say. They call me liar, 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 liar. Um, all I do is quote their sources to them, tell them what their prophet said, tell them what their God said. They call me liar, 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 liar. And yet whenever they talk about what their prophet said and whenever they talk about what their God said, they're making it all up. This, what is this religion, guys? What is this religion? We're talking about possibly evil, demonic, spiritual forces being behind this. Do you see the fruit? Do you see what it does to people? My goodness. <coughs> all right, Tony, what are your thoughts on this? We'll probably... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, it's just a lot... Of it's just a lot of ad hominem there, just just referring to his liar. I mean, uh, just ad hominem assertions are not evidence. He's gone from the Torah is corrupted to, well, not all of it is corrupted, only parts of it are. So you, you see the inconsistency here. Truth is always consistent with itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, unfortunately, this, this just goes back to what we read earlier, that the God of the sage has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. And, it, and it's sad. And again, notice how how often have we been quoting the Bible today? Uh, David, tonight. How often have we been quoting the, the Bible? We've been going to the Quran. We've been mm -hmm. going to the most trustworthy, uh, trustworthy sources in Islam. And what are they doing? They're not supporting uh, our friends on, on the chat. They're actually supporting what we're saying. And so our Muslims, our Muslim friends really have to contend with this, that if you believe that one of Allah's 99 names is Al-Haq, that he is the truth, then how much does this truth matter to you? To, to David and I, truth matters a whole lot. Because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's interesting, isn't it, David, that Jesus also calls himself Al-Haq. He calls himself the truth. He calls himself Al-Nur, I'm the light of the world, the very things that Allah says as well. So truth matters to us, because if we follow the one who claimed to be the truth, then truth matters to us. It really matters. And and with our Muslim friends, I, I just have to, I just have to, just wonder how much does truth matter to you 
it, it, it's it's just incredible. It's pretty bad. Um, they're still commenting. Uh, Muhammad Abdullah here said, uh, I have the Arabic version. It's in volume one. It's talking about uh, the Arabic version of the um, uh, of the Muslim sources, I guess. Uh, or no, probably of a, probably of a, of a commentary. They said, it talks about Surah 2, verse 59 and 279, and it says the Quran refers to the gospel and the Torah. And David knows that, but he'll ignore my comments. Muhammad, show me in the text where, show me from the Quran where this refers to the gospel. Show me. There's not one word about Christians here. There's not one word about Christians. So if you're saying a commentator says it, well, I know I, you're, you say it, right? It's like, oh, I would say it too. I know all of you, you would all, all of you Muslims would say it. I'm saying there is not one shred of evidence here that he is talking to anyone other than Jews. Guys, this is Surah 2. This is when he gets to Medina. This is written after he gets to Medina. There are three Jewish tribes there. Who are the Christians he's talking to? Tell me who the Christians are, that he's talking to are. And and the Quran claims over and over again to be clear. Show obviously you don't obviously you don't need to go to Tabari or something like that to show me what it's talking about. If Allah is clear, Allah's clear who he's talking about. And and so what what you're telling me here is is when this says when when the when this passage says someone wrote something down and said this is the word of God that a Jew and a, a Jew and a Christian simultaneously did this. A Jew and a Christian simultaneously wrote something down and went and went away and said, uh, a, "A Jew did it with the with the Torah, and a Christian did it with the Gospel." Right? Give me some evidence. Show me a source. Show me that that happened. Give me any evidence whatsoever. A Muslim said it. <laughs> guys, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've seen how reliable you guys are when you're talking about our books, right? Um, uh, I'm guessing we should stop, but I want to read one passage just just to show the hypocrisy. Just to show the hypocrisy, Tony. Tony, hmm. did you know that the harshest language anywhere in the Quran that's ever used of a book? In other words, the Quran talks about a book, and Muslims will point to Surah 2, verse 79, and say, you see, it says, someone wrote something with his own hand and said that this is the book. Doesn't say he went and changed the book. Even in Surah 2, verse 75, it doesn't talk. It says some they heard it and then they changed it, right? Uh, and even in Surah 2, verse 59, which uh, uh, which Muhammad there talked about, uh, even in Surah 2, verse 59, it says they heard and then they changed it. Nothing about changing a text here, right? Nope. So best case scenario, we have no evidence that someone actually did something to a copy of the Torah. No evidence that someone actually did something to the Torah. But the harshest language used anywhere in the Quran that's used of a book, because you know, you, you, you know what the Quran says. The Quran does nothing but praise the Torah and the gospel. Muslims right. have to go to these passages which talk about someone distorting the meaning of something or someone writing something. Not one word about being the Torah, not one word about being the gospel. All the passages that actually mention the Torah and the gospel are doing nothing but praising these texts. Right? Muslims ignore all of that. They, they, ignore, they, they do something which is fundamental in Islam. You ignore all the clear passages. Then you go to these other passages, which don't mean what you claim they mean, even according to your own commentators. And you say they mean all these things that the passage can't possibly mean. And if it did mean that, it would mean, it would mean that Allah contradicted himself and, you, and contradicted your prophet. Right. And they go to the, so, so they sacrifice the clear for the sake of the unclear to get the meaning that they want. And that is fundamental. That is, gosh, that is, that is bad. That is scriptural yeah. interpretation 101 bad. bad, right? But the harshest language that the Quran ever uses of any book, for some reason Muslims don't go to this passage. They could. They could, but they don't. Now, let's read it. Surah 15, verses 89 to 91. Harshest language the Quran ever uses to talk about a book. Christians, atheists, Hindus, Everyone who is critical of Islam and wants to have discussions with your Muslim friends, write this passage down. Write it down for just such occasions. Surah 15, verses 89 to 91. And say, surely I am the plain warner. Like as we sent down on the dividers, those who made the Quran into shreds. Let's read a couple of different translations here just to get this down. Because there are some translations that will try to cover up what this is saying and the, 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 how harsh this language is. Let me go ahead and read that again. This is in the, the M.H. Shakir translation. And say, surely I am the plain warner, like as we sent down on the dividers, 
those who made the Quran into shreds. Someone made the Quran into shreds. That is the M.H. Shakir translation. Go with the Yusuf Ali. Yusuf Ali translation is the most popular translation in English. And say, I am indeed a plain warner of just such wrath as we sent down on those who divided scripture into arbitrary parts, who have made uh, so, so also on such as have made the Quran into shreds as they please. This Yusuf Ali is the most popular translation in English, who have made the Quran into, uh, uh, so also on those as have made the Quran into shreds as they please. They have made the Quran into shreds. Let's look at one more. So those are, those are Muslim translations. Let's look at one by a non-Muslim. This is Palmer. And say, verily, I am an obvious warner. And we sent down punishment on the separatists who dismembered the Quran. <laughs> the Quran's been dismembered. Notice all these, the Quran's been shredded. It's been made into shreds. It's been dismembered. Now, Tony, if instead of saying Quran right there, it had instead said Torah, would every Muslim who's been in that chat have immediately gone to that verse and said, you see, this is clear and indisputable proof that the Torah has been corrupted. Would they say absolutely. that? Absolutely. Of course. Of course. Absolutely. If that had said the Christians made the gospel into shreds, the Christians dismembered the gospel, would every single Muslim in the chat right now have pointed to Surah 15 verse 91 and claimed... You see, this is clear and indisputable proof that the gospel has been corrupted according to the Quran. Absolutely, without a doubt, without a doubt. And yet, because it's saying that the Quran was made into shreds, the Quran was torn into parts, the Quran was dismembered, they say it's not even any evidence whatsoever because the Quran has been perfectly preserved and even if the Quran is talking about itself being shredded by people, that still has nothing to do with the Quran being perfectly preserved right down to the letter. Notice the hypocrisy, everyone. Yep. Then they will immediately then yep. they will immediately turn yep. to another passage of the Quran. When the Quran does nothing but affirm the Torah throughout the entire book and praise Jews and Christians as the people of the book. That's not an insult in the Quran. It's a title of honor. We're the people of the book. Well what does right. that mean if our book's been corrupted? The Quran over and over again affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Torah and the gospel. Muslims go to a passage which doesn't even say the Quran. It just says the book. But the historical con the historical context is he's talking about Jews. And we look at what Muslim commentators say about it. And they say someone did this. Someone wrote something and went and claimed that it's from the book. Doesn't say that he, that he took a copy of the Torah and distorted it. Doesn't say any of that. And if that is what he had meant, it would completely contradict everything else the Quran says, because the Quran does nothing but affirm the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah. And if that had happened in Surah 2, if the, if the Torah was somehow unreliable as of the writing of Surah 2 because someone changed it, it would make no sense for Muhammad later in Surah 5 to say, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. It would make no sense for Allah to say that they don't need you, Muhammad, because they have the Torah. None of that would make any sense. And they go to this passage, which cannot possibly be referring to the corruption of the text of the Torah, let alone the Injil, let alone the gospel. It can't possibly have anything to do with the corruption of the Torah, because even if someone did rewrite it, which the passage doesn't say, and which the Muslim commentators don't say, even if they had, that would any Jew reading the Torah would recognize, wait a minute, that's not what the Torah says. That's not what the Torah says. We, 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 what do you mean? Our rabbis know the Torah. That's not what it says. Every Jew, every other Jew on the planet would recognize it, and no one would ever copy that Torah. They would regard it as corrupted. And yet, somehow, Muslims look at that, you see, the Torah, the universal Torah, has been changed and altered. And not just the Torah, somehow by magic, the, the Injil too. Even though the Quran does nothing but praise and promote the Injil, even telling Christians that we have no ground to stand upon unless it's upon the Injil, even telling us that we have to judge by the Injil, which makes no sense because according to our Muslim friends, it's been corrupted as of Surah 279, which doesn't say one word about the Injil and isn't even talking about Christians. They'll go to these passages, which have nothing to do with textual corruption of our book and say, you see, textual corruption, then they'll go to a passage, which really sounds like textual corruption. The Quran's been made into shreds, and it was in a time where you don't have a universal Quran. The only place the Quran is, is right there. 
And so if anyone wanted to change the Quran, that was exactly the place to do it. And yet the Quran says the Quran's been shredded. And Muslims will not take this as any sort of problem for perfect preservation. Do you guys see the hypocrisy here? Do you see it? Do you see the spirit of Islam? Do you see, do you see why it yeah. makes up, down, and down, up? Why it makes left, right, and right, left? Why it just flips everything on its head and then convinces the adherents of the religion to stomp their foot and call everyone a liar who's telling them the truth? Notice the people, me and Tony here, the people who spend hours after hours after hours sitting here with them, trying to get them to see the truth, showing them what their prophet said, showing them what their God said. We're the liars and we're the evil ones. They're leaders who do nothing but lie to them and fill their heads with lies about their book, about their prophet, about the Bible, about Jesus. The people, they're leaders who do nothing but lie to them. They're the good ones. They're the good ones that Muslims love. And no matter how many times we expose their leaders as liars, they keep going right back to them and, and keep quoting them to us. This is amazing stuff. All right, Tony, I'm sorry I went on a rant again. but That's uh, okay. But, uh, that, that uh, had to be said. We're going to go ahead and uh, close out now. So any parting thoughts? Take as long as you need. Yeah, you know what? I, I'm just, I'm just going to mention you've just indicated, David, that it's a double standard. This is something that I always see with our Muslim friends. They'll use one set of criterion for the Bible that they will never use for the Quran. And, and you've just demonstrated that here, that um, the, the, the one standard they use for the Quran is that this is the same Quran that has existed since the time of Muhammad, unchanged, and Gabriel even came down and went, went, went uh, through it with Muhammad another time, and so just to make sure he got the whole thing, which again is false. We can demonstrate from history, from Islamic sources, none of that happened. And then when it comes to the Bible, and we have, of course, we are, we've got over 5,700 copies, manuscripts of, of the Greek New Testament. We have tons of, of manuscripts in Sahidic and Coptic and Latin, Ethiopic and Georgian and so forth. The same thing with the Old Testament. We've got the Leningrad Codex, the Aleppo Codex. We have the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls from Qumran that are at least 100 BC or probably even later or older than that. Uh, we have the Septuagint, 250 BC. When we look at all of this information, and, and we're not, you know, we don't pull back, David. We don't pull back and say, well, you know, uh, we don't have any textual variance. Of course, we recognize that. But to come out and say that the whole Torah has been corrupted, when we can trace the transmission of the Torah from the Leningrad Masoretic text right through to the Dead Sea Scrolls, that copies every book of the Old Testament with the exception of the book of Esther. And notice the, the transmission that has come to our day the one thing the scholars recognized when they looked at the Qumran Dead Sea Scrolls was the amazing fashion in which that transmission has gone from that period before Christ, 100 BC or so, up into our day. But when we look at Quranic manuscripts and we look at the way the Quran came together, and this is this is this is available for for all to see. I mean, scholars have been looking at this for many years. We know that the Quran was not complete when Muhammad died. We know that it was scattered, and, we, and then when Zaid bin Thabit was asked to compile the Quran, remember what he said, David? He said, it would have been easier for me to move a mountain than to go looking for the, the shreds. And that's kind of interesting. You mentioned Surah 1580, 1991. That's how the Quran was when they were trying to put it together. It was in shreds. It was pieces of bone here, palm leaf over here, and so forth. And then we see what happens under Uthman. He makes one standard text of the Quran. Our Muslim friend said, no, 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 no. There were different ways to read it. Well, you don't, you don't have to destroy manuscripts if it was just based on readings. They destroyed it because there were real textual variants in there. And then, of course, uh, under um, uh, Al-Hajjaj uh, with Abdul Malik, there was another recension where he did the same thing, destroyed all other competing manuscripts. So all of that to say that when our Muslim friends keep repeating the same, the same canard that the Quran is this perfectly preserved text. The evidence shows otherwise. But what it's, is really offensive is when they come out and say, the gospel's been corrupted. Where, when, how? The gospel that Muhammad had in his day and that the Christians in Arabia <laughs> had, we know what it looked like. Uh, if we look at Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, 325 AD, when we look at the Bodmer Papyrus, the Chester uh, Beatty uh, Papyrus, which, which has many of the Gospels. We know what the Gospel looked like. Guess what? It looks like the Gospels we have today with the death of Jesus, his resurrection, Jesus being the Lord, Jesus being uh, Son of God, and, and so forth. But it's interesting, David, there's one thing our Muslim friends did not bring up, and that is the Zabor. 
the Zaborah are the Psalms, right, that were given to David. So the only things that, that, that our friends have been after is the Torah and the Injil, but nothing has been said about the Zabur at all, uh, which are the Psalms. But what I want to leave you with this is, is this, to our Muslim friends out there, David and I do this not for the sake of our health. We're not, we're not here, David's there night after night, and my ministry is very similar to this, but we're not here just for the fun event. We are here because we care. We are here because we love you, and we want you to know that God has shown his love to the world, not by sending some, some fellow who, who, who was terrified that he was possessed or he was suicidal or he, 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 he had sex with a nine-year-old girl. He sent his own beloved son into the world, and he showed his love by living the perfect life that you will never live and I can never live, David can never live. He lived the perfect life for us, and he paid that penalty for sin, the sin that separates us from God. And he gave his life for sinners on the cross of Calvary. But he did not remain dead. The good news is that God raised him from the dead on the third day. And because Jesus Christ lives, we have the assurance of our sins forgiven, and we can know God personally as Father. And we can know that we are saved. And we can know that life has meaning and purpose. And so the good news of the gospel is this. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. My prayer for you, our Muslim friends, we don't hate you. I hate Islam. I hate the system of Islam, but I love you. You are a human being made in the image of God. And the good news is that God loves sinners. My prayer for you is you come to know this Jesus, not the, the, the revised, uh, revamped Jesus of the Quran, but the real historical Jesus who came into the world, gave his life for sinners, was raised from the dead, and one day he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I hope that you will meet him as your savior and not as your judge. The time is now. The Bible says the day of salvation is now. It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And so our, our heartfelt prayer for you is that you would come to know Jesus Christ, know him as Lord and Savior. And it is such a wonderful thing to know God as Father, to say to him, Abba, not just to say, Rab, Lord, Master, but to say, Abba, Father. That's our prayer for you. And we hope that you make that decision for Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, just a couple uh, quick comments here. Uh, Madbuli Urshad said, when has a Muslim leader ever lied about Quran? 1591. Perhaps Muslims in this chat don't understand the Arabic, but can you show evidence of a scholar being dishonest? Uh, Madbuli, I think you totally misunderstood the point. I'm not saying that that verse actually refers to the Quran being corrupted, right? I'm saying of all the verses, of all the verses in the Quran that talk about a book, the harshest language used anywhere is used of the Quran. It says, and it's talking about the Quran. It's not saying someone wrote something and claimed that it's a book. It says they shredded the Quran. They, they made the Quran into shreds. If that had said the Torah were made into shreds, every Muslim in the chat would have went to that verse first to show that the Torah has been corrupted. If that verse had said the Injil, was made into shreds. Every Muslim in that chat would have said, you see, this proves it. But since it's the Quran, they suddenly turn that off and nope, this can't possibly refer to anything. I'm exposing hypocrisy. So in a verse, the harshest, the harshest language used of any book is used about the Quran and it has nothing to do, according to Muslim, it has nothing to do with the text of the Quran being changed. And yet they'll go to other verses which talk about someone hearing something, hearing something and changing it with their words, or that'll talk about someone writing something and claiming that it's a book, unnamed book, some unspecified book, and they'll claim, you see, universal, global corruption of not only that book, but also the gospel as well. Guys, you can't have a more inconsistent, hypocritical method than the one you have right now. If using this method, you could defend anything. There is no position in existence which you could not defend by this method anything. As a rule, if your method, if the method that you use to get you to the truth could defend any lie, could be used to defend any lie that any man has ever told, 
probably need a, a, a new method. Uh, and then Sabir added to that, he said, Lowell, Bart Ehrman has made enough videos to prove these claims about the preservation of the Old Testament and New Testament are preserved. Um, wow, he said, he said, Bart Ehrman has enough videos to prove these claims about the preservation of the Old Testament and New Testament are preserved. Cool. He agreed with us that the, uh, that uh, our book's been preserved. Let me go ahead and put that up there. Great comment. He said, Lowell, Bart Ehrman has enough videos to prove these claims about the preservation of the Old Testament and New Testament are preserved. Great. Well, notice, uh, goes to an atheist, <laughs> goes to an atheist or possibly agnostic uh, scholar. Who, who, who would say the same thing about the Quran. Yeah. And actually said it's very similar and, mm -hmm. and, and was once asked, why doesn't he write a book on the Quran? And he said, I'll write a book on the Quran when I stop valuing my life. Yeah, he knows he'll be so killed. what does that tell you? He That's knows right. he'll be killed for analyzing the Quran the way he analyzes the Bible. Correct. And apart from that, would agree with everything we're saying about the Bible, right? That's right. Bart, exactly. er Bart Ehrman says, oh, there are lots of textual variants. And oh, look at that. Great. We, you can go into any Christian bookstore and find discussions of those textual variants. Yeah. Notice. We, we've, known, we've known about them. Yeah, notice, time. we don't deny the evidence, right? But everything we everything we can show from the Muslim sources about entire chapters of the Quran coming up missing, large passages coming up missing, uh, verses being uh, large passages being lost in battle because the only people who had them memorized died in battle, verses being eaten by a sheep. Um, none of this, none of this uh, is relevant to Muslims. Son, somehow, it's perfect preservation right down to the letter. Um, if you go through the Quran manuscripts, what do you have? Variants all over the place. Variants all over the place. Mm -hmm. And somehow, somehow, because we're honest, because we're we're honest and we talk about the variants, somehow this shows that we're stupid and is, Islam has the truth. But notice this, Tony. We'll close with this. Notice. If you have two groups and both of them have a book, but because these books are copied by hand, you have mistakes and so on. If two people have have that situation with their books because anytime you have people copying entire books by hand you're going to run into you're going to run into errors and one of those groups of people acknowledges that they try to gather as many manuscripts as possible so they compare them and mm -hmm. see where the change occurred so they can get back to the original one one group does that whereas another group they burn everything to pretend that those, those, those disagreements are never there. And then they deny them so that you can walk into any Muslim bookstore and you never find that sort of thing. They don't even, they don't even talk about it. And even though you can line up manuscripts that still exist, again, not even ones that are all burned, um, you can line up manuscripts and see all the differences and changes due to copyist mistakes. Right. And somehow right. this group will say, nope, perfect preservation right down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad. It's a miracle. And anyone who says otherwise is a liar. Tony, which of those two groups would you think are people of the truth? The ones who admit, the ones who admit that there are variants and scrabble changes and so forth. But even Bart Ehrman, David, Bart Ehrman says every cardinal doctrine of the Christian faith is not affected by any of these variants. And so Ehrman will openly admit that, yeah, the, the early Christians believed Jesus died on the cross. They believed that he was raised from the dead. They believed that he was the Lord, that he was the son of God. Well, if, if Bart Ehrman, who is an agnostic, I guess he's an agnostic now, he's willing to question his faith or question uh, his religious beliefs, um, Bart Ehrman is willing to admit that the Christian doctrines of Jesus' death and resurrection and his identity as the divine Son of God is not affected by any of these changes. Will our Muslim friends now accept that? Well, of course they won't. They're not interested in truth. They're not interested. All they're interested is in to divide and conquer. And unfortunately, that's that's not how truth works so the very enemy that the very person they claim is a big critic of the new testament believes jesus died on the cross well are they willing to believe that now because bart Ehrman believes it so mm -hmm. it's a very selective any mini mini mo attitude that they take david mm -hmm. and of course uh you know as 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 james white has said before the sign of an inconsistent uh, the of the find of a the sign of a failed argument is an inconsistent argument. Mm -hmm. And that's what we always uh, we always find in our Muslim friends, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And notice, Tony, all of this was, it was in response to show us what evidence you have that Muhammad's a prophet, right? 
Yeah. We get if you yeah. ask if you ask us why we reject Muhammad, we give you argument after argument after argument after argument, and we could do yeah. ten we could do ten live streams in a row filled with oh, our yeah. arguments against Muhammad. Oh, yeah. We ask yeah. Muslims, we ask Muslims guys, what is your evidence that he's actually a prophet? And what we got was Bible's been corrupted, Quran's been perfectly preserved. And Muslims, how did that go for you? All right. <laughs> Catch y'all next time. Uh, tomorrow, I think I have uh, I think I have an ex-Muslim who's going to talk about Muhammad's uh, night journey. And then on Thursday, I'm going to have a victim of coronavirus on with me, who's an apologist, um, who Sean Hurst, who has coronavirus. He, he runs a channel, uh, Mixed Martial Apologetics. Friday, I think we'll come together for the uh, the flu tank clan, where we'll just uh, we'll, we'll have a live hangout with everyone. Um, all right. So thanks to Tony for uh, joining us, guys. Uh, link to um, the site, uh, the, the YouTube channel, The Third Degree, is in the description box. Tony uh, helps uh, with a lot of videos on that channel, so check it out. And catch you all next time.